Uh, thank you so much for that great introduction, Brett. Uh, welcome everyone back to another uh, session of the Majesca Simpkin School of Human Rights. Uh, of course, in the chat, you may have already seen that uh, Brett told you that uh, we're here tonight for your amazement and amusement. Uh, certainly, you're going to get plenty of that this evening. And uh, I want to start off actually by pointing out something. And I think our class this semester, uh, the schedule has been very fortunate in terms of memorializing peoples and events in South Carolina because today is actually Septima Clark's birthday. Uh, she was born on this date in 1898. And Septima Clark, of course, is someone we're gonna talk about in depth this evening. Um, now, Brett mentioned that we're gonna try our best to get to 1968. Of course, on the study guide, we're going from 1955 to 1968. And um, really there's a lot we have to get to this evening. I'm hoping to cover everything from um, Sarah Mae Fleming through the governorship of George Bell Timmerman all the way up to the Orangeburg massacre. And perhaps we might even get to the Charleston hospital strike of 1969 if we have time. Uh, certainly I don't wanna give any short shrift to any of the monumental events that took place in South Carolina, but uh, as April and Randall say in the chat, good evening, everyone. I'm really glad to see everyone here this evening. And by the way, I hope folks are staying safe. We've had some really bad weather here in the Midlands in the last few hours. Uh, it's not gonna let up, at least for this evening. So please, wherever you are, stay safe, stay warm and be careful out there. If you have to go anywhere, but please stay home uh, this evening if you can. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get tonight's session started. And again, as always, please, please feel free to ask any questions you might have or post any comments you might have in the chat. I'll do my best to respond to those. And one last thing before we get started, I do apologize for my voice. I have a minor sinus issue going on right now that happens every time uh, during the year. Now, So if I sound to you like a 1930s gangster out of a movie, I do apologize, but that's just... <laughs> So uh, I will I will spare you my impersonation of James Cagney uh, and instead go ahead and get us started this evening. All right. So, of course, South Carolina in the 1950s and 60s, like virtually every other southern state at this time, was really grappling or let's just be honest about it, really trying their best to resist uh, the onward march of the civil rights movement. Now, by this point, 1955, We've already had the Brown v. Board decision of 1954. And of course, in 55 itself, we will have the death of Emmett Till. Now, I want to point out how both of those events are incredibly important. Brown v. Board, of course, was a decision that said that, that segregation um, was no longer constitutional. It overturned the Plessy v. Ferguson decision. At the same time, the following year, the death of Emmett Till is going to really galvanize many younger African-Americans. If you read any memoirs written by black activists who came of age in the 50s and early 60s, many of them, Cleveland Sellers among others, they always mention in their memoirs that it was the death of Emmett Till and the subsequent not guilty decision, the acquittal of those who were accused of murdering Till that really pushed many of them into the civil rights movement. That's not to say they wouldn't have gotten involved otherwise, but it certainly gave them extra fuel for their fire, so to speak, in terms of being involved in their activism. That was certainly the case right here in South Carolina. Now, I've mentioned Sarah Mae Fleming already a, a couple classes ago in passing, but I did want to talk about her again very quickly because, of course, the uh, Fleming uh, case, the Fleming v. South Carolina electric and gas case, is going to be one of the cases that leads to the end of the Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama in 1955-56. Now, for those who don't know, uh, Sarah Mae Fleming, um, she was a, a young woman who was um, a domestic worker. She was on the bus and she was violently thrown off of a bus at the corner of, of Maine and Washington streets right here in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, now she was ordered off the bus and she was attacked uh, by the driver while trying to exit the bus and they essentially, again, Majeska Simpkins encourages her to, to file suit against the company that owned the buses, South Carolina Electric and Gas. Now, here's what's interesting. If you've read the study guide, I want to make very certain everybody's clear about this. If you've read the study guide, then you would have read that the case was originally dismissed 
by South Carolina Judge George Bell Timmerman. Now, here's the thing. That is a name you're going to see again very soon. Uh, this is George Bell Timmerman Sr., who was a judge um, in, in the state court system, in the district court system, uh, and he's the one who originally just basically dismisses this case. Now, the lawyers for the case, um, Matthew J. Perry and Lincoln Jenkins, uh, Perry here, uh, you see uh, Matthew Perry right here, they decide to try to take the case above uh, Timmerman, and they go to the appeal to the Fourth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, which actually overturns Timmerman's dismissal. By the time the Fleming case gets to the Supreme Court in 1956, however, uh, the court is already taking a look at the Browder v. Gale case, which is coming out of Montgomery, Alabama. Now remember, think about your civil rights history chronology here for a second. 1955 is the year the Montgomery bus boycott begins. And by 1956, it's basically winding down. And that boycott comes to an end with the Browder v. Gale decision, which basically ruled that segregation in buses in Alabama was unconstitutional. However, the Fleming case actually gives the Supreme Court some of the legal precedent they need to go ahead and make the Browder v. Gale decision. Now, one of the things that I want everyone to think about here is that this is another instance, uh, just like uh, was the case with Briggs v. Elliott that we discussed in the last class, where you have cases coming out of South Carolina that have national importance and yet they're being overshadowed by other very similar events. Of course, Briggs v. Elliott being overshadowed by the Brown v. Board decision of which it was included. And then the Fleming v. SC electric and gas decision being over, um, over, overlooked and really overshadowed by the Browder v. Gale case and the Montgomery Boys bus boycott of 1955-56. Again, it's important to note that the idea of boycotting buses was nothing new. Uh, it certainly wasn't new in the Sarah May Fleming situation. It wasn't new in the Montgomery bus boycott. You'd had attempts at bus boycotts throughout the South in the 1940s and 50s. It just so happened that the Montgomery bus boycott came at the precise right moment with media coverage of civil rights really ramping up. And of course, having folks like Rosa Parks and especially Martin Luther King Jr. able to really engage the media effectively, that leads to the Montgomery bus boycott being the most famous of all these bus decisions. Now, what you're seeing in South Carolina and really across the South, as civil rights organizations are trying to build up their strength, and we'll come back to that in a second because in South Carolina, it's an incredibly mixed bag, you do have a, a white response, uh, sometimes through the recreation and formation of the Ku Klux Klan across the South, uh, but in many other instances, you have the rise of what are called white citizens councils. And this is actually the logo you can see here on the screen, citizens councils, states rights and racial integrity. And as you uh, glean from the readings for this evening, Orangeburg County was actually a critical center of the white citizens councils right here in South Carolina. Now that's really worth thinking about when we get to the, the Orangeburg massacre later on in tonight's class, but certainly you really wanna consider how resistance to civil rights took many different forms. Uh, there were folks who said that the white citizens councils were nothing more than, I think there's one quote that refers to them as uh, the Klan in suits or the Klan in business suits, so to speak. Um, Often the folks who members of white citizens councils, they, they weren't working class. They were oftentimes well-to-do businessmen, the, the white city leaders in, in many towns and cities across the South. There were folks who were well-to-do uh, and who really offered a more genteel approach to opposing civil rights. Uh, they would often cloak their actions in rhetoric of states' rights, uh, rhetoric of just keeping the peace, rhetoric of law and order and the like. And they proved to be incredibly formidable opponents of civil rights in the 1950s and 60s. Now you do have the KKK around uh, carrying out more violent actions, but the white citizens councils were incredibly threatening precisely because they included so many prominent businessmen, politicians, city fathers, city leaders, and the like. And so 
one thing you want to really get out of tonight's class is to think about how uh, the civil rights movements throughout the 50s and 60s across the country were opposed by a wide range of adversaries. Uh, we, we all think of the KKK as being a big one. They certainly were important. But arguably, the white citizens councils were more dangerous because of the power their members actually held in society. But of course, this backlash of civil rights in South Carolina and across the South, it wasn't just the purview of the KKK or the White Citizens Councils or other like-minded organizations. It was also certainly the purview of many politicians across the South. Now, during the 50s and 60s, if you ran for high office in the South, whether it, whether it was South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, et cetera, you really had to essentially run on an anti-Black platform. Uh, to give you an example from Alabama, uh, I think many of us have heard of George Wallace, the notorious politician and Alabama governor who in 1963 at his inaugural address said segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. What many folks may not know, however, is that Wallace ran for governor in 1958 as well and lost uh, to John Patterson. And when Wallace lost, he was quoted as saying, and apologies for the language, but this is what he actually said, I'm not going to get out niggered again. Across the South, if you ran for high office, you had to run on the question of racism. I'm not saying the question of race, I'm saying the question of racism. And proving your bona fides in terms of opposition to civil rights was critical if you want to hold high office in the South. This was certainly the case for George Bell Timmerman Jr., the son of the judge we just talked about a moment ago, Timmerman will become governor of South Carolina in 1955 and lead some serious statewide efforts to resist civil rights. Now, you notice, again, the timeline here is very important. Uh, he is governor at around the same time as the Grissett Commission, or excuse me, Grissett Committee uh, really comes into power under Marion Grissett that's really trying to enforce segregation across South Carolina in the 1950s and 60s. Under Governor Timmerman, uh, the state assembly does take a series of actions that are also designed to block the efforts of the Brown v. Board decision, designed to block the efforts of burgeoning civil rights campaigns across the country, really in an effort to try to keep South Carolina as deeply ensconced in Jim Crow as they possibly could. And so, you have things like in 1956, uh, the state legislature, which in 56, it has what's called the segregation session, where they pass a series of bills designed to severely weaken the NAACP and other groups while also strengthening uh, Jim Crow segregation in South Carolina. One of the things they do is that they pass legislation basically saying that if you're a member of the NAACP, then you're barred from public employment. And of course, public employment in this case means most notably school teachers and other peoples who uh, have state supported jobs, state government jobs and the like. Um, and this is really important because it's going to influence how the civil rights movement in South Carolina takes shape in the late 50s and early 1960s. Now, if you join us last week for our deeper dive, into the SNYC, uh, then you might recall that we did a lot of talking about how the SNYC, this really radical organization, uh, would have its 1946 convention in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And yet by the early 1950s, the SNYC have, had it basically been wiped out, partly because of McCarthyism and partly because of, of more stringent anti-civil rights laws all across South Carolina. You're seeing this happen more and more in the 1950s and early 60s with legislation designed to target NAACP in South Carolina. Uh, Alabama's taking very similar steps. Uh, in the late 1950s in the Deep South, it was incredibly dangerous to be a part of the NAACP. And the thing is, is that again, every politician who is involved with po politics in South Carolina has to say something about desegregation in some form or fashion. Of course, Timmerman is governor of South Carolina. Uh, he is really leading the anti-civil rights forces in the state on the state level. Um, 
Meanwhile, Strom Thurmond in the Senate is certainly leading the charge of Southerners on a national level against civil rights. Now, one, one quick uh, question in the chat. I see Miko has a question about how do they know who's part of the NAACP? That's a great question. Uh, sometimes they were able to get access to NAACP rosters. Uh, they were able, in other cases, they had people who were informants in the, in, the, in the NAACP, letting folks know who was and was not in the organization. Um, there were a wide range of methods. Now, one thing about this that's also important to note, and I'm glad you asked this question, is that across the South, uh, you do have different state governments setting up what were basically what we would think of as state-sponsored intelligence forces, you know, uh, not quite on the level of, say, a, a, you know, a KGB or the like in the Soviet Union, but they were setting up these internal security apparatuses that were designed to figure out who was in the NAACP, who were in other like organizations. For example, Mississippi I had what was called the State Sovereignty Commission. And I'll actually put this in the chat um, because uh, Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission was one of the most... Um, dangerous organizations in the entire country. Uh, they assembled files on every civil rights activist in the state for decades. Uh, in South Carolina, with the NAACP, what's happening is that, again, government forces are able to get access to the roles of the NAACP. Um, they're able to do have informants in the, in the NAACP, folks who are trying to save their own jobs. It's a very dangerous situation. And Again, the danger is partly because there is so much united white opposition against civil rights. Again, the Brown v. Board decision awakens this, well, let me put it this way. It, there was already, already a backlash on the way in the South. You think about what we've learned the last two classes, right? This, this white fear in South Carolina of the potential of black political power through the vote that you see reawakened in 1944 with the Smith v. Allwright decision and then with Elmore v. Rice by 1946. So there's already this fear of black political power in South Carolina, but the Brown v. Board case takes it to another level because now you have the federal government half-heartedly, it must be said, taking a stance against segregation. And of course, in the Senate, Strom Thurmond is leading the effort against the 1957 Civil Rights Act, which is the first Civil Rights Act debated by Congress since the 1875 Civil Rights Act. Um, it's a very weak piece of legislation. It doesn't do anything about voting rights. It doesn't do much in the way of public accommodations. Some of the big things that civil rights activists are fighting for, but even as a weakened bill, Southerners like Strom Thurmond, Richard Russell of Georgia, and many others are deeply opposed to it. In fact, Thurmond himself uh, actually has a 24 hour long filibuster in the US Senate designed to stop the passage of 1957 Civil Rights Act. It does ultimately pass, uh, thinks primarily the efforts of a senator from Texas named Lyndon Johnson, but nonetheless, the Southern opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1957, led again by Strom Thurmond, really shows how deeply entrenched the anti-civil rights forces are throughout the South. Now, I mentioned Fritz Hollings here because, um, although I think most of us remember him, if you remember him at all, as a senator from South Carolina, um, before that, he was governor of the state from 1959 to 1963. And, you know, Hollings is, is really interesting because he's often noted as a politician who represents South Carolina, finally turning the corner on segregation in 1963. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. When we get to the segregation of Clemson and USC, I'll come back to, to Hollings as governor and, and what he's saying in 1963 is all that's taking place. But for many civil rights activists in South Carolina, Hollings is not seen much as a friend at all. Um, at best, he's seen as an impediment to further progress on civil rights. Okay. Now, a couple of classes ago, we were talking about Majestic Simpkins uh, trying to find methods by which to bypass the, the onslaught of, of state-sponsored uh, repression throughout South Carolina in the 40s and 50s. One of the things that she does that we talked about two classes ago was creating citizens committees. 
And of course, the biggest one was the Richland County Citizens Committee. Now, this was originally set up, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, as a shadow organization of the NAACP. She actually used that phrase. Again, these were committees that were designed to really alleviate some of the pressures on the NAACP in South Carolina during the 1950s. But especially after NAACP uh, loses a lot of support because again, the legislature is targeting NAACP members who are public workers. The citizens committees become incredibly important in helping to keep the civil rights movement going in South Carolina during the late 1950s. There, there are other forces at play in the state that we'll talk about in a moment that are also really um, holding up that torch of civil rights activism, but certainly the citizens committee committees led by Mr. Simpkins and others are really important in keeping that going. So I think one thing I wanna say here is that remember that the Vanessa Simpkins School is not just about history, it's also about considering how to apply that history to your own citizenship and if you want to do so to your own activism as well. And certainly one of the lessons we should take from this is thinking about how to strategize in case your own organizing activities come under severe critique, come under severe surveillance. Um, again, this is not just something that's theoretical or even historic. But I do want to, uh, since we're on the late 1950s, I do also want to discuss one other big thing that's going on that, that involves education in South Carolina during this time period. Uh, so Brett, could you come in for just a second? I'll stop sharing my screen real quick and let you chime in here for a moment. Uh, Robert, you're sharing your screen. You want me to talk about uh, the creation of uh, educational television? Oh, please go right ahead. The, uh, in, in 57, um, there was a movement in the legislature, discussions about closing public schools rather than integrating them. And um, I, I had, I didn't, I stumbled onto this and uh, I think it was 2008 when Representative Cobb Hunter handed me a briefing book that she's on the Joint Bond Review Committee of the Senate and the House that oversees all acquisitions and uh, dispositions of state property, leases, rents, et cetera. And the Broadband uh, Disposition Commission was created because when the um, signals were compressed and we went digital in, in 2008, there was what they called excess capacity. And um, he told me to look into it. I spent eight months being the only person at these hearings that wasn't paid to be there. And that what it was was that I discovered that South Carolina had, it was the only state that owned all the educational broadcasting licenses in that state, in our state. No state, no other state does. And when you, when I started looking into it, I saw the headlines in the paper that were juxtaposed in 1957, South Carolina legislature debates closing schools rather than integrate, South Carolina starts educational television. And that it went on from there and over the, over the years, we developed uh, an educational television system that is literally second to none in, in, the, in the country. Uh, third most capable uh, broadcast capacity in the nation. Um, and that what was probably one of the most frustrating things I've ever worked on is being able to be to gather the data to show the um, bond commission that was going to decide what to do with this stuff, how the state could save $2 billion by not renting it out and using the publicly owned broadband to do things like provide um, the Wi-Fi for the campus at USC that they're paying at that time $800 million a year to AT&T. All the counties and the cities and all are paying AT&T and Verizon or whoever they're paying for access to internet and broadband. And knowing the opposition to competing with the uh, corporate interest, interest in the legislature, we narrowed that down to say, well, let's at least give the 460,000 school children that qualify for federally financed free lunch access to free broadband. And that they're already identified, we don't have to do anything, flip a switch, do a little bit of work. You have to do some transmission, uh, the addition of a uh, 
piece of equipment on a tower to get the broadband signal converted to where they can pick it up locally. Cost about $25,000 a tower. As uh, nearly a thousand towers we own in 63 licenses, the only broadband system in America that covers the entire state that's owned by the public. And when I suggested that the people that didn't have money for food probably didn't have broadband at home, Harvey Peeler, the senator from Cherokee, said, "Mr. Bursley, that would be socialism." And so we 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 lost, but we retain we retain the spectrum. And someday somebody's going to have the time to, to work on this and try and get the, um, the recover the broadband signals for the people in South Carolina that bought them and paid for them. But this is a legacy of our Jim Crow that they're actually still uh, riding on um, oppressing the people that they wanted to keep it from. And you may have noticed during the, the pandemic, the places that didn't have broadband, they would drive a school bus that had broadband and park it in the community but wouldn't let the kids on it. And so the kids had to stand in the rain or the cold or whatever and try and keep up with their lessons. Uh, I just think it's an a, a, a illustrative point about the kind of brutal and uh, petty nature of our Jim Crow system. Thank you, Robert. No, thank you. And I'm, I'm actually glad you brought it up because um, on a personal note, teaching at Claflin during the pandemic, I can assure you I had numerous students who in order to take classes, they would have to go to parking lots of restaurants and, and other places just to get decent Wi-Fi signals to, to take classes. Um, again, a, a, an impediment to, to learning effectively and learning during a pandemic. Um, but again, these are the kinds of choices our, our higher ups have made to you know fight the, the bad old demons of socialism. Uh, so, I think that's a really interesting segue because education here is a big part of what we're talking about this evening. Of course, the pursuit of quality education uh, for African Americans is a big part of the civil rights movement, but also the use of education as a weapon um, in terms of, of fighting for uh, civil rights and indeed human rights. And that actually brings me to Septima Clark, uh, who I mentioned as sort of class this afternoon, or rather this evening. Uh, today, May 3rd, is September Clark's birthday. And Clark was the kind of person who steadfastly believed in the importance of education, uh, and not just in helping folks get quality jobs or get a career going, but more importantly, believed in education as a tool by which to, to gain one citizenship, civil rights, and indeed human rights. Now, by the late 1950s, by the time period that we're talking about here, uh, Clark has been teaching in the Charleston Public Schools for some time. However, she is also a member of the NAACP, and she, of course, loses her position because of the legislation passed by South Carolina state government uh, during this time period. Now, Clark eventually, with, with having lost her teaching position in South Carolina, uh, she decides to really turn full time to her activism. Now, by the 50s, she had really been trying to develop ideas of how to teach people their rights as citizens, uh, their rights as human beings. And she saw that the biggest way to do that was to help folks who were illiterate learn how to read so they could pass things like literacy tests and so they could read the law for themselves and figure out uh, what their own actual rights were as citizens of South Carolina and of the United States. Now, when Clark loses her job as a, as a Charleston uh, school teacher, uh, she decides to turn to the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee and to work there full time, again, developing what will become known as citizenship schools, uh, eventually known as citizenship schools uh, across the South in the 1960s. Now, what's really interesting, and I, I think if, if there are any students out there who are undergrad or master students, what have you, uh, there are some really fascinating um, connections uh, between Charleston and the Highlander Folk School. Of course, the last class we mentioned, the song We Shall Overcome coming out of 1945, uh, Cigar Factory Strike in Charleston. Of course, we have Tima Clark doing her work with the Highlander Folk School in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and of course, as we'll see later on, you, you have these connections uh, really continuing on. Now, the thing is, is that if you were in NAACP in the 50s, 
um, after that law was passed by the state government that barred NAACP members from having uh, public employment, you did have a choice to make. You could either stay in the NAACP and lose your job, or you could renounce your NAACP membership and keep your job. So again, these were really hard decisions being made by many African Americans who care deeply about civil rights in South Carolina. Now, one other thing about Clark, um, of course, she goes to the Highland Folk School in the 50s to work there to develop the idea of citizenship schools. By the 60s, of course, she starts working alongside Martin Luther King Jr. in the Southern Christian Leadership um, uh, Council to really develop these citizenship schools across the South. Uh, now, the SCLC, we, we don't really talk about them that much in the context of South Carolina, but I do want to very quickly point out how the SCLC was pursuing a particular strategy in the 50s and 60s that was really tied to voting rights. Um, by the early 1960s, you do begin to see some civil rights activists talking about using the power of the ballot in order to uh, increase support for civil rights in the South and across the country. Remember, this is a post Smith v. Allwright era. This is a post Elmore v. Rice era. So you're starting to see more and more African-Americans across the South when they can participating in democratic primaries. Oftentimes they, they aren't really able to participate in the state primaries, but you are seeing more black voters participating in municipal elections and city elections all across the South. And so the political dynamics of the South are starting to change. Um, the biggest change of course, being the white backlash to civil rights, but folks like Clark, Dr. King, many others are hoping that the power of the ballot will help them actually overcome some of that in, in the short term. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. So this actually brings me to student activism in South Carolina. And I know several of you in recent classes have asked about the role of younger activists in the civil rights movement. You've asked about the role of HBCUs in the civil rights movement. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about right now because of course, by 1960, 61, uh, you've already had about a decade or so separation between the new generation of activists and the heyday of more radical activists in groups like the SNYC, uh, the more radical wings, the NAACP in South Carolina and elsewhere. Um, you're, you're really having these younger activists who are coming of age in a post Brown v. Board world who are trying to look for new examples of activism. While many of them appreciate Dr. King and the SELC, they want more direct action against segregation. Now, some of you may already know uh, that in 1960, you do have a meeting of numerous uh, black student activists at Shaw University, in North Carolina. And in 1960, they're meeting to come up with a, a new idea, a new organization that can really carry the torch forward in terms of civil rights activism. And of course, at that meeting is also the great Ella Baker, uh, the famed civil rights activist, the famed civil rights organizer, who by 1960 had worked with the NAACP, she had worked with the SCLC, but she saw in these students some genuine raw potential for true direct action and true small d democratic activism. And so in 1960, you have the formation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, um, not to be confused with the Southern Negro Youth Congress, the original SNCC that we discussed last week in our deeper dive. But I mentioned SNCC because of the fact that by 1960, you're also starting to see African-American college students across the South beginning to do sit-in demonstrations at uh, segregated lunch counters, uh, other places of uh, public accommodation in an attempt to force the issue of desegregation across the South. And of course, you see here uh, a, a photo from dedication of a, a small landmark that's actually on Main Street in Columbia now for the Bowie v. City of Columbia decision from 1964. Now, as you read the um, marker here, this is actually based off of two black college students, Simon Bull, Bowie and Talmadge Neal, actually protesting a local uh, Eckert's luncheonette. They decided to do a sit-in 
Um, they were, of course, uh, refused service because they were black at, a, at an all white lunch counter. And what happens is that the owners of the Eckert store walk up to the two men and basically held up a no trespassing sign. Uh, the two men refuse to leave. They are arrested. And eventually this becomes a case that goes all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1964, in the Bowie v. City of Columbia decision, the Supreme Court rules that actually under the 14th Amendment, the folks who ran the Eckert store did not have the right to kick out those students and have them arrested. Um, the timing of the decision, of course, is ironic because it came just a couple of days after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, making the, the decision essentially a formality at that point. But nonetheless, you do see in the late 50s and early 60s, the rise of student activists all across the South. One of your readings, of course, uh, gets into the activists who were at South Carolina State College in Orangeburg, South Carolina, who were uh, leading demonstrations and pickets in Orangeburg in the 50s and 60s. Again, very dangerous work considering that Orangeburg was also the center of the white citizens councils in South Carolina at that same time. You have student activists at Allen and Benedict who are becoming very active in Columbia, South Carolina leading the segregation movements in the early 1960s. You have students at Voorhees College also getting involved in um, civil rights activism. And so, what you're seeing in the early 1960s is a new generation of African-American college students, many of whom came of age in the aftermath of the Brown v. Board decision, the Emmett Till case, and the constant promises by the national government of civil rights for all. They came of age during this era and decided we're going to do something about it. Now, again, for those in the room who are interested in activism, you want to think about some of the tactics they used, uh, sit-ins, direct action, uh, much of it based off of nonviolence, but all of it based on the idea of direct confrontation and also trying to create what they refer to as leaderless movements. Um, there is a saying, I believe, from Ella Baker that, that she basically said, strong people do not need strong leaders. In other words, trying to get away from the charismatic form of leadership uh, and instead adopting a more small, deep democratic form of activism. Of course, you have the growth of, of groups like the Friendship Nine, uh, which was another uh, protest uh, movement that was based out of South Carolina around this same time period. Um, and really, again, I know that we've discussed this ad nauseum at this point um, of how um, again, the Friendship Nine, for those who don't know, that was also a sit-in protest that occurred in South Carolina in 1961 at a McCor McCrory's lunch counter. Um, now, what happens here with the Friendship Nine is that, like so many other folks doing sit-in protests in the early 60s, they were also arrested. But what the Friendship Nine did that was so different, uh, when they were arrested, they decided to not pay their bail. They adopted the attitude of, of jail, no bail, uh, basically saying that they felt that there was, their argument was very simple, that if we pay the bail, then we're conceding guilt over doing something wrong. And so they felt that as people protesting against injustice, the Friendship Nine argued, well, we have a right to sit at these lunch counters as citizens of this country, uh, we have a right on the Constitution to do so. And so we're not going to pay the bail. We're going to just spend our time in jail. Um, and this was actually a method that was supported by Martin Luther King and other uh, prominent civil rights leaders. And you begin seeing more activists across the South pursuing the jail, no bail strategy. Part of it was to take the moral high ground, so to speak, and say we don't concede having any actual guilt here. But part of it was also a tactic in terms of getting further media attention. Oftentimes the media would cover a civil rights protest and then leave right after it was over. They're saying, let's, let's create more, um, a, a bigger atmosphere for more coverage by staying in jail, making sure folks understand why we are here and understanding that we are not willing to concede the moral or legal high ground to anyone by paying our bail. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. And again, of course, 
I, I want to point out how over and over and over again in South Carolina, you're having all these momentous events that are going to have an impact on the national civil rights movement and in turn have a decisive, decisive impact on how the nation is seen by the rest of the world at large. Uh, certainly, you also think of the Freedom Riders going through the Deep South in 1961. The Freedom Riders were testing recent Supreme Court decisions that outlaw segregation at bus stops. The Freedom Riders from SNCC said, well, let's actually test that out and see how it works. And some of the most violent opposition they face actually starts at Rock Hill, South Carolina, when some of their buses are actually attacked by anti-civil rights protesters. <clears throat> Of course, South Carolina is also incredibly important to the civil rights movement and to broader uh, movements for, for justice and freedom uh, via the Edwards B. South Carolina decision 1963. Now, this decision was actually based off of a protest uh, in 1961 by Allen and Benedict students uh, on the state house grounds of South Carolina. And they were protesting for civil rights and against Jim Crow segregation in the South. Now, the students were on public ground. They were right outside the state house. And of course, they were also arrested. Now, the Edwards v. South Carolina case in 1963 actually decided that, well, in fact, if you're a person who is protesting on public land, you have a right to protest there. Like the, the, the state government or local government can't do anything to infringe upon your rights to protest on state property or state grounds. And the Edwards v. South Carolina decision, of course, is very important for civil rights activists, but it's also incredibly important for a wide range of social movements in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and up to the present day. Again, having the right to protest on state grounds, state house grounds, on um, public grounds, that is a major legacy of Edwards v. South Carolina from 1963. All right, okay. Now, let's see. Now, um, now, Brett, did you want to say something about how this ruling has personally affected you in terms of activism? I think we have some time to, to actually do that. It's important that people really embrace the notion that if we learn from those that have been in the trenches before us, our trench isn't quite as deep as we think it is. Um, the Edwards VFC case uh, in 19, oh Lord, I don't remember it. <laughs> Somewhere in the 80s, somewhere in the 80s, uh, GROW, which I was the director of, the Grassroots Organizing Workshop, which formed the Progressive Network in 96, we got permission to put up a sign on the State House grounds at a time when nonprofits, 501c3s, nonpartisan nonprofits, could put up a sign professionally made with certain posts so far apart and put it up for, um, I don't know, uh, weeks, a month or something like that. And we followed all the rules, got the permit, went to put the sign up. And they told us they'd change the rules. And they, I said, well, when? And they said, this morning. And I said, well, why? And they said, well, we don't know. And so we, we went through a process of finding out that Governor Campbell, the sign said, remember Vietnam, keep South Carolina National Guard out of Central America. And so anyway, that case ended up in federal court. And we cited the Edwards VSC case and uh, the federal judge uh, on hearing Governor Campbell say that he, he was afraid the sign would fall over and hurt somebody. Uh, not the fact that we were excoriating the fact that he was sending the National Guard to, to uh, Honduras to do maneuvers on the border of Nicaragua when the U.S. Congress had said you couldn't do that. So we won that case. And then um, a decade later, uh, the Occupy movement on the State House grounds was told they couldn't be there, and they cited the same case. And so this is the like we build history, we make history. Now, uh, thanks, Brett. Now, I, I do see Michael's question in the chat about will Edwards v. South Carolina help to stop or minimize the impact of anti-protest laws passed and considered around the country? Uh, that's that's a really interesting question. But Brett, did you want to take that on? Well, I think that there's going to be plenty of arguments that the, the village square, which is the people's property, which is the state house is something that is designed and, and protected by the Constitution and the First Amendment. And, and you hear the conservative elements talking so big about the, you know, the First Amendment and freedom of speech. These are things that have to be litigated, obviously, if it gets to that point. But the, um, 
the cases that there's tremendous precedents, uh, Star Stadium, where they don't overturn precedents, and that um, in Washington, D.C., uh, they have rules that we modeled uh, when we won the federal lawsuit uh, against Campbell, where we're not asking permission to use our property. We're making a reservation for time and place. And so the only thing that they can do is they say, well, you can't have your event, your picnic, your rally, whatever, on the north side of the state house because we've already let the Klan do the same thing there. And so it's not a matter of permission. We don't ask permission for, unless we're doing something illegal, like we want to block a street, okay, you need a permit. But to be able to express your First Amendment rights, pretty well embedded in laws that have been established by, you see, going back to 1961, that um, it's going to be difficult for a state government uh, and the Supreme Court to uh, take away uh, the rights of people to assemble on their own property. Just that, that's it. Anyway, that's my optimistic projection of as we move into uh, a totalitarian threatening government here. Oh, right. And, you know, I, I think, uh, of course, Becky has graciously shared with us the, uh, the sign that, that Brett was talking about. I'll, I'll also share my screen really quickly and, and for folks who may not be able to see, um, for whatever reason, the actual sign. Um, but again, as Brett has pointed out here, this is actually one of the reasons why <clears throat> this class exists, because a lot of the lessons we're, we're learning from the Reconstruction era, uh, from the era of the early civil rights movements in the 30s and 40s, or what we're seeing now in the 60s with the student-led protests, all of these lessons, they still have something to tell us in the here and now. And I think in particular with this edition of the Majestica School class, as we're having these really deep and I think concerning discussions about democracy or some semblance of democracy in the United States today, um, in the here and now, a lot of these lessons, again, are, are incredibly important for all of us to hold on to. Of course, we'll get more into and to grow in the next class. Um, we do want to save some of the secrets here. What what the heck did they do with that $50,000? Stay tuned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into that. Uh, don't worry. Uh, by the way, before we go on, I do also want to put in the chat a link to a um, a, a book that is a really good one. It's called uh, Poll Power. Uh, it's actually about some of the... Um, voting rights efforts in the early 1960s uh, through the Voter Education Project uh, that was actually backed by President John F. Kennedy. And again, Brett has talked a lot in the last few classes about the difference between a human rights movement and a civil rights movement. And actually the Voter Education Project kind of straddles the line because President Kennedy in the early 60s supported it because he felt it was a better use and a, a less dangerous effort by activists to get change than direct action protests of SNCC activists and others in the early 60s. And that, that book really goes into detail about it. And I mentioned that book because uh, the man who, man who wrote it, Evan Falkenberry, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, he actually has some material from Orangeburg that's in the book about the voter education project in Orangeburg during this same time period. Um, now, the thing about what's going on with uh, the movement by this point is that of course, uh, by the early 1960s, you are starting to see more efforts um, in South Carolina, bringing some fruit um, in terms of, of activism and uh, more campaigns for civil rights for African-Americans. So I wanna actually read to you now, <clears throat> I said I would come back to Governor Ernest Hollings later on in this class, and that's what I'm gonna do right now. I wanna read to you a part of uh, Hollings' last speech to the General Assembly in January of 1963, when he's about to leave office as governor. Quote, excuse me, quote, this assembly must look at South Carolina's role in the nation if it is to do its job well. Whether it realizes it or not, it is a part of the space age. And if we are to compete, if our people are able to have a chance at good jobs, if the communities are to continue to attract new industry, if our children are to be educated and skilled, and if we are able to, if we are to retain these children as useful leaders for the state, then it will be because the, this assembly had courage. A call on this courage is imminent. And he goes on to say the following, and listen very carefully. 
because this is actually for many as a momentous moment in the history of civil rights in South Carolina, but you want to listen to the kind of language he uses here. Quotes, we have all argued that the Supreme Court decision of May 1954 is not the law of the land. But everyone must agree that it is the fact of the land, interposition, sovereignty, legal motions, personal defiance have all been applied to constitutionalize the law of the land and all attempts have failed. As we meet, South Carolina is running out of courts. If and when every legal remedy has been exhausted, the General Assembly must make clear South Carolina's choice, a government of laws rather than a government of men. As determined as we are, we of today must realize the lesson of 100 years ago and move on for the good of South Carolina and our United States. This should be done with dignity. It must be done with law and order. It is a hurdle that brings little progress to either side, but the failure to clear it will do us irreparable harm, end quote. So Governor Hollings gave that speech in January of 1963. And right after that, Harvey Gatt desegregates Clemson University. And later that same year, these three people, Robert Anderson, Henri Monteith, and James Solomon, desegregate the University of South Carolina. Now, what's interesting here is that Monteith was actually a relative of Majestic Simpkins. Uh, and Simpkins actually encouraged her to go ahead and try to actually desegregate the University of South Carolina. Uh, now, what's really interesting about these three people and, and Gantt at Clemson is that before that, there have been attempts to segregate various schools in South Carolina and across the South. Um, for example, in the 1940s, there was an attempt by, by John Wrighton to actually segregate USC's law school. And I mentioned in the last class that leads to creation of the law school at South Carolina State. The irony here being is that in 1963, it was lawyers trained at SC State's law school that paved the way for these three students to actually go to the University of South Carolina. Um, in the late 1950s, you actually have Allen University students at one point actually marching from Allen to USC and trying to apply to be students at USC in the late 1950s. Of course, the registrar at USC said, well, you can't do that. The Allen students asked, well, why not? And the registrar flustered said, well, I mean, you're, you're a black student. You just can't, you can't apply here. So by 1963, we've already had various attempts to segregate USC and other Southern universities. But by 1963, these efforts are finally paying off. And as you heard in Governor's, Governor Holling's speech, he's trying to really show a, a roadmap forward for the state where he quietly acknowledges that, hey, we don't really like civil rights. We don't really like what's going on in the country. But as he put it, we are running out of courts. And so he's trying to uh, create some idea, some way of really having it both ways, of, of the state acknowledging civil rights gains, but at the same time, not giving up too much. Now, in the terms of James Solomon and Walker Solomon being related, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I, I actually, I actually don't think they're related. Um, but I will, I will certainly look into that because I, I've not heard about him having a relation with Walker E. Solomon, but it is certainly possible. Um, now, the thing is, it's important to note that James Solomon was actually a native of Georgia. Um, and the thing is, is that Solomon, out of these three, um, what makes him interesting is that Solomon was actually going to graduate school at the University of South Carolina. So by that point, he'd already received degrees from Morris College and from Atlanta University. So I don't think he led, led to Walker Solomon, but I will check just to be absolutely sure. Okay. Now, you're seeing desegregation starting to pay some dividends in South Carolina and across the South. Of course, 
1963 is also the year of the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. Uh, 1963 is also the year of the four little girls being killed in Birmingham, Alabama by a bomb planted at the 16th Street Baptist Church. 1963 for many was also the year of what was called the Negro Revolution, where all across the country, not just in the South, you have aggressive direct action civil rights protests breaking out everywhere, not just in South Carolina, Mississippi, or Georgia, but also in New York, in Chicago, in Oakland, in Los Angeles, in, in Chicago, all over the country. There is a, a new mood in the air. It, it had been there for a long time, but 1963, you see the culmination of it all across the country. But of course, not everyone is happy about that. Now, we spent some time in this class talking about how the politics of race and racism are changing the politics of South Carolina, the politics of the South, and certainly the politics of the entire country. You may recall that in the 1948 election, you have the rise of the Dixiecrats as a splinter from the Democratic Party trying to force the issue of civil rights to the back burner, uh, however they could. By 1963, however, you do see more and more white Southerners starting to entertain an idea that just a generation before would have been unthinkable, joining and controlling the Republican Party. Now, by 1963, uh, you have wealthier white Southerners like Roger Milliken, who was a textile magnate from South Carolina, a very influential figure in the state, who are beginning to take a harder look at the right wing of the Republican Party. <clears throat> now, at that same time, uh, the more conservative members of the GOP, folks like Barry Goldwater, were beginning to argue to state and national party leaders in the early 1960s that it was time for them to, as Goldwater put it, quote, hunt where the ducks are, end quote. Essentially saying that for far too long, conservative Republicans have been riding out off the South simply because of the tradition of Southerners, white Southerners, voting for the Democratic Party. Now, by 1963, this has taken on added importance and urgency because many conservative Republicans felt that the 1960 election was lost because Richard Nixon was not conservative enough. They felt a more conservative hard right candidate like a Barry Goldwater would have had a better shot of not only winning the election, but peeling off more white Southern voters who otherwise have hardly voted for John F. Kennedy. And so Milliken joins the draft Barry Goldwater campaign in 1963. Uh, this is an attempt to essentially try to push Republican Party in a more right wing direction. And they felt that Goldwater was the best choice to do this. Now, it's important to note that both parties by 1963 and for a generation or two had had both liberal and conservative wings. Uh, the Democratic Party had Northern liberals, but also had Southern Dixiecrats. Likewise, the Republican Party had a Northern and Western progressives, but also had Northern and Western conservatives. In fact, if you read some of the works of Martin Luther King Jr. from this time period, going into the mid to late 1960s, King often spoke of the two great adversaries of civil rights the Dixiecrats in the South and right-wing Republicans in the North. And what you're seeing here is folks like Roger Milliken also acknowledging this natural alliance and saying, let's go a step further and put ourselves under the same political party. And so Milliken in 1963 is part of the effort to support Barry Goldwater as the Republican nominee for president in 1964. An effort that of course, pays immediate dividends with Goldwater being nominated in 64, and over the longer term, pushes the Republican Party further to the right, uh, and of course leads to the politics of the 70s, 80s, and the polarization of today. Okay, and, and certainly I see some, some mention in the chat about the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, we, we will definitely be talking about the ERA in the next class when we get to the 1970s, because that is also a really, really important story of the politics of South Carolina in terms of, of gender 
in the 60s and 70s. And as you can see here, many of the folks talking about now, your Roger Milliken, your Sean Thurman, your, your Fritz Holling, et cetera, they're going to continue to play a pivotal role in the state's politics going to the 70s, 80s, and so forth. Now, again, another, another big part of, of how South Carolina is so important to national politics um, is the rise of folks like Harry Dent. Um, now, Dent, for those who, who may have heard of him before, you probably know him best as one of the chief architects <clears throat> of what we now call, what was called at the time too, the Southern strategy. This idea that the Republican Party had to tack hard right on issues of race and racism in order to win disenchanted white Southern voters. Of course, that strategy was tried to an extent in 1964 with Goldwater's nomination, but it was certainly put into practice in 1968 when Richard Nixon ran for president once again and pursued a strategy of, of really using the rhetoric of law and order to really cloak ideas about race and really stymie the civil rights movement under a more genteel, I guess, ready for prime time strategy of talking about law and order, using coded language to talk about race. One of the big architects was the, of that was Harry Dent, who was also a critical aide to Strom Thurmond uh, before he became um, an architect of the Southern strategy and also someone who helped Richard Nixon and the Republican Party more broadly speaking. Uh, don't forget, of course, in 1964, not only does the Republican Party nominate Barry Goldwater, but Strom Thurmond also in a remarkable moment changes parties from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party in 1964, again, representing how the South and South Carolina in particular represents the heart of a new conservative strategy designed to peel away millions of white Southern voters from the Democratic Party. Now, I mention all of this because I want everyone to keep this in mind. At the high point of the civil rights movement, the mid 1960s is occurring at the same time as you're beginning to see these, these rumblings, first on a national level, later on a state and local level of party shifts and party affiliation shifts amongst white Southerners, broadly speaking. Now, this is a map of the 1964 um, presidential election. And of course, the blue here is for Lyndon Johnson and the red is for Barry Goldwater. And as you can see here, Goldwater as the hard right conservative only wins the deep south in his home state of Arizona. Now it's worth noting by the way, that Goldwater's opposition to the 1964 Civil Rights Act was based not so much on racism. He was actually a member of the NAACP in, in Arizona at one point, but it was based more on a libertarian reading of the Civil Rights Act. And, and Goldwater felt that it was overextending the power of the federal government into realms of public life that it shouldn't be at. Later on, Goldwater admitted it was the worst mistake of his presidential career, or of his career as a politician, but the damage had been done. Uh, in 64, uh, on a national level, Martin Luther King Jr., for the only time in his public life, publicly supports a candidate for president, Lance Lyndon Johnson. Um, you, ha <clears throat> you have Jackie Robinson, the, the, the famous baseball player, who's also an activist in the Republican Party, speaking out vociferously against Barry Goldwater. In the 64 convention in San Francisco, um, Jackie Robinson actually says that he, quote, felt like a Jew in Hitler's Germany, end quote, talking about just how anti-Black and how racist the convention, Republican convention felt to him and other Black Republicans. But you can see here that South Carolina is one of the places where the party shift is already starting to begin. And I know when folks talk about the Southern strategy and the party shift, we think of it as white people voted Democratic one day, and the next day they woke up again voting Republican. It's not quite as simple as that. It took about a generation or two for it to really kick in. But you do see it starting to pay some dividends uh, very soon. <coughs> Excuse me. And indeed, you're seeing it pay off as early uh, as 1966 with the midterm elections, uh, again, where law and order is being invoked in a 1968 with the presidential election. As you can see here, Richard Nixon uh, winning a majority of the states, including winning a good bit of the South, and George Wallace winning the, the Southern states in the sort of uh, 
dark yellow mustard color right here. Um, but again, all of this is intricately tied to the civil rights movement. Yeah, and, and Nixon was also, he had affiliation with the civil rights movement in the 50s and early 60s, but he certainly by the late 60s saw where the winds were blowing in terms of civil rights and public support for civil rights. Now, I've been talking about this on a national level uh, for a bit, uh, but I do want to bring things back to South Carolina because what you're seeing in the state internally is that South Carolina is, of course, not immune to these changes in, in state and national politics. Now, by 1967, you do have Robert McNair, who was governor of South Carolina, and he is a Democrat. Uh, he is trying to like Hollings before him, trying to promote this more moderate middle of the road strategy of gradualism when it comes to civil rights in South Carolina. Now, as many of you probably already know, uh, South Carolina for decades since the civil rights movement's heyday has prided itself on talking about a state that did civil rights the right way. That was a state that was able to avoid the violent outburst in Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia, just to name a few examples. Of course, this isn't really true. Um, certainly in South Carolina, if you stretch the civil rights movement back to the 30s and 40s, there's certainly plenty of dangerous moments in the state. And even looking in the 50s and 60s with the NAACP uh, almost being outlawed uh, with so many other things going on in the state in terms of legislation designed to stymie uh, desegregation laws. It's quite clear that the politicians in South Carolina are talking a good game about gradualism and moderation. But if you're a black person on the ground in South Carolina, you are quite simply frustrated with how slow things are going. And certainly McNair would embody this during what was one of the biggest crises of his, of his governorship. Uh, and that was of course, the Orangeburg massacre of 1968. Now, I, I wanna slow things down here just a little bit uh, and, and speak to you as someone uh, who was not just a historian, not just an academic, but someone who teaches for a living in Orangeburg. Teaching at Classley University, uh, it, it means that I, I actually, my, where my classroom is located, I literally teach across the fence from South Carolina State University. And every February 8th, there is a service held on the campus of SC State where the communities of Claflin and SC State come together to remember the three young men who were killed on the night of February 8th by South Carolina police officers and troopers. Now, as I mentioned before, by 1968, you've already had years and years of student activism at SC State to lesser extent at Claflin going on in Orangeburg. And this kind of activism, again, was very dangerous, not just because it was, it was in South Carolina, but because it was in Orangeburg, which, as I mentioned before, was the one of the chief bases of operations for the white citizens councils. But even with schools like Clemson and the University of South Carolina being desegregated, it's really HBCUs that continue to serve as some of the leading intellectual and emotional centers for student activism throughout the 1960s and even into the 1970s. Certainly, if you look at many of the SNCC activists who were going across the South in early to, to late 1960s, Many of them were from HBCUs, like Howard, Fisk, Shaw, uh, Morehouse, Spellman, SC State, Claflin, Voorhees, Allen, Benedict, so on and so forth. And I want everyone here to understand one very important thing. Many of these young people, when they went off to be activists, when they went off to Mississippi, or the heart of Alabama, or when they went off to Louisiana or elsewhere, when they went throughout South Carolina, they knew they were not simply going to protest. They knew they were not simply going to organize 
African Americans in these parts of the country, they also knew there was a very realistic chance they could die. And I don't say this lightly. I, actually, let me let me stop sharing my screen for just one quick second. I do want to share with everybody here in the chat um, something that I think is is worth noting. This is from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, and I'll, I'll share my screen with this as well, because I want to make sure everybody sees this. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center has a, a website dedicated to civil rights martyrs. And if you look at this website, I just want to show this to you. It starts in 55, and it ends with Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968, which I think is a little unfair because you have activists for civil rights being killed after that and before this. But just this limited list shows you the extent to which people paid the ultimate price for civil rights in the 50s and 60s. And these are people that we've not really had a chance to talk about in depth because we can focus on South Carolina, but a lot of them were folks who were killed in Mississippi. My notes, including Emmett Till, folks died in Texas, Alabama, uh, Mississippi again, Mississippi again, Mississippi once again, Mississippi again, and you notice these are not just African-Americans either. These are folks like French journalists who are being killed. Uh, you have other white activists who are being killed like William Moore right here, um, Maker Evers, of course, uh, the four little girls who were killed in Birmingham. Um, also people kind of forget about Virgil Ware who was also killed in Birmingham the same day as the four little girls were killed. Um, more folks in Mississippi and Florida and Ohio, all over the place. Of course, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner were killed in Mississippi in 1964. But I, I show this website to you because at the bottom, uh, you have, because it's a chronological order, three men who died in Orangeburg, Samuel Hammond, Delano Middleton, and Henry Smith, who again were killed because they were part of a protest movement that was trying to desegregate the all-star bowling alley in Orangeburg. Remember, this is four years after the Civil Rights Act had been passed by Congress and signed into law. And yet there were still places in the South that were segregated like this all-star bowling alley. Now, the police claimed in the immediate aftermath of the massacre in which these three students were killed and numerous others were wounded, the police claimed that they were fired upon first. They said that someone must have shot at them uh, it must have been those, those dastardly Black Panthers, some Black power activists and the like. Of course, as we all know, there was no evidence of anyone shooting at the police, but there was plenty of evidence of the police not only shooting at these young students, but shooting many of them in the back. Again, what's, what's important to note here is that Orangeburg, the massacre itself, it took place in 1968, right? And there's a lot going on in 68 with the Vietnam War, with the war on poverty, with movements for freedom all over the world at this point. The Orangeburg massacre kind of gets overwhelmed by other media coverages. Like it does get brief attention to New York Times and then it's quickly forgotten about. Unless you're on the left, um, I, let me see if I can find this thing really quickly. I do apologize. I, but there's something I want to show you guys that I think brings this home. And this actually ties together what we discussed last week. So while the Orangeburg massacre didn't get much coverage in the national press, um, amongst the left-wing press, it was a different story. So I want to show you guys. So Last week, Eric Gelman mentioned a magazine, Freedom Ways Magazine, which was the chief organ of the Black left in the, in the 60s and 70s, early 80s. I want to show you guys a page from the spring 1968 issue of Freedom Ways, which actually came out right after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., so it was dedicated to him in tribute. But when you open up that magazine, the first thing you see is this page, In Memoriam to the Martyrs. And on the top, you see five Black Africans who were uh, lynched, hung, 
by the Ian Smith government in Southern Rhodesia, a white supremacist regime in what is now modern day Zimbabwe. And then at the bottom, you see Sam Hammond, Delano Middleton, and Henry Smith, assassinated by government troops in Orangeburg, South Carolina, January 1968. And they got the date a little bit wrong there. That was February 68. But I think you see the point here, that there were many activists, many on the left in America and abroad, who saw these three gentlemen, who saw Orangeburg, South Carolina, who saw the state of South Carolina as part of a larger global struggle for freedom and against oppression. And so while we spent a lot of time this evening talking about how the civil rights movement in South Carolina was certainly struggling to hold on to some of its promise in terms of being a human rights campaign, there were those on the left who would not let go of that so easily. Now, what's interesting about the Orangeburg Massacre is that the only person arrested as a, as a result of it was the activist Cleveland Sellers, uh, who by that point had gone from being in SNCC to being a prominent Black power advocate. And really, the thing about the Orangeburg Massacre that's worth noting is that you cannot separate this event from what's going on across the country with the Black power movement, how more, um, how many younger African Americans while still involved in civil rights activism and protests, we're also moving towards the Black Power Movement, saying things like Black is beautiful, uh, wanting to really spend more time on Black self-determination in terms of Black self-governance in the Deep South, for example, or the creation of Black Panther parties in Oakland and then across the country throughout the 19, late 1960s. Uh, when Orangeburg takes place, folks like Governor McNair and others say, well, it just had to be outside agitators. Of course, criticizing the communists, as was tradition by this point, but also outside agitators by 1968 meant the Black Panther Party. It meant Black power advocates. Uh, it meant people who, like their forefathers and foremothers generation or two before, were trying to make ties between what was going on in Orangeburg and what was happening in places like Rhodesia and South Africa or Vietnam. And yes, they, they, they still very much do that today. Um, and, and actually, I'm glad that Brett has, has posted in the chat a, a great film called uh, Scarred Justice about the Orangeburg Massacre uh, in 1968. It's a, it's a film we've shown before in the Majesta School. Um, but what's really interesting is that this is not the only instance, and, and I want to I'm going to go a little bit beyond 68 for a hot second because we'll come back to, to Vietnam in such in the next class. But I do want to end class by talking about the Charleston Hospital strike. Because I think that this is one of those moments in the history of South Carolina, like the Orange Road Massacre we just discussed, where all these ideals of civil rights, of human rights, of economic justice, are all being brought together once again in Charleston. It seems that with the Majestic School, everything ultimately comes back to Charleston. In this case, uh, the hospital strike was led by mostly black hospital workers and nurses who felt and actually proved that they were being underpaid in comparison to their white counterparts doing the same kinds of jobs. Um, and of course, uh, the the movement, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. The Charleston Hospital Strike Movement, um, it becomes for a brief moment, one of the big national events taking place in 1969, which is again saying a lot because 69 was the height of the Vietnam War. It was the height, it was the beginning of the Nixon administration. We put a man on the moon, summer of that year for goodness sake. And yet uh, the Charleston Hospital Strike um, was, also attracting national attention. Um, part of it was because it was an example of African-American workers trying to actually establish membership within a union, which was not often seen in the Deep South. Uh, they contact their local 1199 uh, to actually form a union to fight for better wages, better pay, um, better working conditions in the hospitals in Charleston. 
And what ends up happening is that the local 1199 uh, actually contacts its, its mother organization, New York, for additional support. So you start seeing union activists, not just in the 1199 in Charleston, but across the country, getting involved in the actual hospital strike. Also, many civil rights activists, like uh, Ralph Abernathy, who at this point has taken control of SCLC in the aftermath of Martin Luther King's assassination the previous year, Andrew Young, and most notably Coretta Scott King, they were all coming to Charleston to help organize folks there and to offer national support to the Charleston hospital strike. Again, this strike becomes a momentous moment because what you're seeing here is folks like Coretta Scott King and others linking the ideals and the optimism of the civil rights movement on the one hand with the traditional and very much modern calls for economic justice on the other. Again, these things had never really been divorced. We, we tend to think of civil rights as one thing and economic rights as another thing. That's complete other bull. They were all one and the same, but that was made especially crystal clear during the Charleston hospital strike. And there was a, a great film that was released at, right after the strike uh, called I Am Somebody, uh, which is a 30 minute film. There's a link to it um, on the Majestic School website um, that is all about the, 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 the hospital strike. And what's great about the film is that it's not like most documentaries where you have this omnipresent narrator who knows everything, can see everything, and is telling you what to think about what you're seeing. Instead, most of the footage is letting the folks speak for themselves. Uh, including there's a, 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 an interview with the guy who was in charge of the hospitals in Charleston who actually says, this isn't a civil rights issue, it's just a, a strike. And then the person off screen asks him, why isn't it a civil rights issue? And the guy says, well, it isn't. Because he actually knows it is a civil rights issue. He just can't think of another answer besides just saying it isn't. All right. So um, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, again, what we're going to do with the next class, class six, is we're going to start up in 68 and 69 with uh, the Vietnam War protest and also get a more get deeper into things like the United Citizens Party and the like. But I wanted to end with the hospital strike because it is one of those momentous moments in the history of not just South Carolina, but really the history of the nation in terms of talking about civil rights, economic rights, and human rights as well. Robert, I was in the hospital strike in 68. I mean, I was in the march. I was working for Southern State Organizing Committee then and met Mary Moultrie and some of the other people. And I guess what I want to lift up is not enough has changed. Not enough has changed. I worked mm -hmm. with Mary probably, I don't know, in the last six or eight years of 1199, trying to organize sanitation workers in Charleston simply to get the things that they were promised, like gloves and hepatitis B shots, and to be able to call the ambulance if somebody gets their arm caught in the crusher and they don't have to call management. And so th that struggle for workers' rights in Charleston and in South Carolina and across the country is still something that hasn't progressed much since 1968. Brett, I, before we go on, uh, a couple of quick things. So um, the link on, on Justice School website to the I Am Somebody film, it takes you to a version of the film you have to, to rent online. But you didn't see this for me. I'm going to drop another link in the chat uh, for the film that uh, may be a bit um, more cost effective, if you will. Um, and actually, I, before we get to the Q&A, if you don't mind, I do want to show a minute or two of the film. If you if can you, do that, go for it, sir. Um, I because this actually it, it shows Coretta Scott King speaking in Charleston in '69 um, about what's going on, and she's trying to really galvanize the folks there. So let me just share my screen really quickly, and I I'm going to urge folks if you have 30 minutes to spare this week or next week, uh, please try to watch the film as soon as you can. So uh, let me go ahead and play it. Well, just a couple minutes really quickly and then we'll move on. I understand that this was like my thing. It was something I had to do, you know. So um, 
lot, and we worked it out, and he bared with me until the end of it. A few months ago, I was proud to accept the position of honorary chairman of the National Organizing Committee of Hospital and Nursing Home Employees, the organization that has sparked this crusade for freedom and dignity here in your city. I did so because I know that hospital workers have been working full-time jobs at part-time pay. After all, a dollar and 30 cents an hour is not a wage. It is an insult. I also have another interest for being here, and that is many of the hospital workers throughout our nation are women, black women many of whom are the main supporters of their families. I feel that the black woman in our nation, the black working woman is perhaps the most discriminated against of all of the working women. The black woman. And If my husband were alive today, he would be right here with you tonight. <laughs> As a matter of fact, my husband often said that 1199 in New York was his favorite <laughs> union. But after watching what you've done here in Charleston, I must say that my favorite union is local 1199B. times when we were so depressed in Charleston. And then here comes a lady, a great lady, like Coretta King. She came to Charleston in March in the streets with us. It made us feel real good. It really uplifted us. It gave us the strength and the courage that we needed to face the folks of Charleston and do what was necessary to win the strike. wanted to show <clears throat> again just a couple of minutes um of of the film and uh, hopefully that whets your appetite to to watch it um and yeah this is um i'm putting the link in the chat right now the link i just put in the chat is uh the free one you can access at vimeo um so that's actually what i was just showing you right there a moment ago uh hopefully they will like forget that it's up there because they have a, a version of it that you have to pay for and then you have that version just shows you you get the exact same footage, but without the cost. So hopefully they will they will ignore it. But it's it's a 30 minute documentary. Uh, you didn't hear that from me or anybody else here in the class. Um, but again, I hope if you have a time to watch it, you really should check it out. And by the way, I saw a question about uh, accessing uh, Scar Justice. Uh, I'm not. I, I know that one's online. I'm not sure if it's free. I know via Canopy, if you have, say, a Richland County library card, you have access to Canopy. Um, and or I think any library system in South Carolina, you should check. You likely have um, access to that film, Scar Justice. Now, the film I just showed you a clip of was I Am Somebody. Um, that's about the 1969 hospital strike. Uh, but Scar Justice is about the Orangeburg massacre. And that one, again, is available via Canopy, which again, if you have a library card in Richland County, or I think most South Carolina, you should have access 
to Canopy. If you have an Amazon Fire Stick, I think you have Canopy as well. So, like in that one. Robert, I want to I want to pitch the uh, Scar Justice film. Um, Jack Bass was a reporter for the Charlotte Observer that was on the ground in Orangeburg during the killings. And he's somebody I've come to know. He, he's been a guest presenter. At, he lives in Charleston. He's been a guest presenter at some of our Majestic School meetings. And, and the Scar Justice has footage from a town, town hall meeting at uh, SC State after the shooting with the mayor of Orangeburg. It just evidences something that we all need to understand about how deeply woven uh, the um, notion of systemic racism is into the government in South Carolina and elsewhere, where there's this rather lengthy passage where one of the students is asking the mayor to pronounce Negro. And he keeps saying Negro. And <laughs> the student takes him through saying knee, as a knee, as your knee, grow, G-R-O. And it was just, it, it really puts it into some perspective that has been missing about the, the, the inability of the white people there to understand the, the, the anguish and pain and, and struggle that's gone on. And more currently, one of the things that's really delightful that we'll have more information on is that uh, Millicent um, Brown, one of our presenters just recently, is working with a group of people that bought the bowling alley and they're turning it into a civil rights museum. And we'll be doing a field trip someday soon uh, to the uh, all-star bowling lanes in Orangeburg where the uh, dust up started that ended up with the, uh, the killings. Uh, at Orangeburg, and it was just, it was clearly uh, from the people I know that were there, and uh, I, uh, it was just an execution. They, they, they shot, they killed three people, wounded 28 people, most people were shot in the back of the feet, and um, it just didn't get much, it, it, it's never really had recompense here in South Carolina. Indeed, indeed, and so I wanted to open the floor for questions and the time uh, we have remaining this evening. Um, so any questions folks wanna uh, put in the chat about what we've discussed this evening? Uh, Robert, if we have some people that don't know how to chat, they could raise their hand, you could call on them. Okay. Sure, that also works as well. Again, you can just go down to the little uh, reaction button and just raise your hand, uh, you know, like, so like I'm doing in my little box right here. Uh, but again, uh, we're looking for any questions you might have um, about what we discussed this evening. Again, I think the big thing you wanna take away from this evening is that even though we tend to uh, glamorize civil rights movement uh, across the South, what you see in South Carolina, especially is a movement that is running up against constant opposition. Uh, opposition that takes many different forms from the KKK to white citizens councils. Uh, in the next class, we'll talk about actually an incident in Lamar in 1970 that also shows how this, this kind of thing just doesn't stop. Uh, I don't want people to think that, oh, the civil rights movement won the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and everything was great after that. Couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, South Carolina may have gotten more violent after the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, as we saw with the Orangeburg Massacre, and as we'll see with Lamar in our next class. Any questions for this evening? Okay, Ms. Hammock, go right ahead. I see your hand was up. Jean, go ahead, please. I think you're still muted. We're talking to Jean Hammock as opposed to yes. Marjorie. Jean, you're muted. I'm mute. How's that? There we go. Okay. Ahead, it seems like you said that we seem to be on a Ferris wheel that keeps going round and round and round. The, the situations come up and the reaction to the situations are always the same. They change the law. They get... Uh, there are riots, and uh, but mainly they change the law. So I I don't know how to deal with it, but I think we're in another area, er, another time when we have the laws being changed again, and 
how do we deal with that? We know that these voting rights laws that are coming down are for the same, same purpose. They see that African American and brown, black and brown people are voting. So they want to crush that. How do we push back on that? We organize. <laughs> I mean, no, it's the same thing. I mean, Mother Jones said a long time ago, like 100 plus years ago, don't mourn, organize. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the system is so um, intricately woven to perpetuate itself. Yes. And it erases history yeah. of people resisting and oppression and people uh, after the certainly the people, young people that came aware during the Obama administration, all of a sudden, everything that happened with Trump was new to them. They didn't remember the protest against lynchings or the marches and the bleeding and, you know, Selma and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, like, continue to reinvent ourselves. And, and part of what the Progressive Network is working on, um, we, we've been here nearly 50 years, inherited stuff from people that were here 60 years before us, is institutionalizing that and, and building uh, a word of mouth beloved community that can share yeah. this information and support people. I think that we've got some good plans. We need some troops. Right. And so the school, in part, is to help train up people to learn how to be either an effective citizen, which could be helpful, or actually, you know, if you're retired or independently wealthy or we find some money, you can be an actual organizer. And so, yeah. Gene, we just got to keep doing what we've been doing and do it better and longer and hope the kids can pick it up. Okay. But I think also we need to spread the word. You know, I grew up in the North. I knew none of this Southern history. And we're in a time when we can interact with people in other areas to get this, this story out to everybody. Well, it's a story that, that's pretty well, everybody's got their own story, every state's got their own story. And one of the things that, that we preach in the Majestic School and we talk about in the Progressive Network is that all politics is local. Yeah. We can go to Washington and protest, we can go to regional meetings and protest, but what we realize after we do that for a long time is, damn, I gotta go home and do the work. And the work <laughs> is the hard stuff. Yeah. And it's being able to show people that people think that caring doesn't do any good. One of our main missions is to mm -hmm. try and show them that caring can do some good. Yeah. And the first place you start is it makes you feel better to care and to yeah. have some type of constructive input into society's messed up stuff. And we get enough of those people together, then you have like a beloved community that can be uh, a ball rolling down the hill, hopefully mm -hmm. towards justice. And so that's what we're creating, a big ball rolling down the hill towards justice. I think Martin Luther King called it a mighty river, but mm -hmm. it sounded much better when he said it. <laughs> more questions? Yeah, I see some more in the chat. Um, let me just handle a few of these right off the bat here. Okay, so you have a question about Clemson. Um, so... Clemson's desegregation movement. Yeah, you, you're right, Rhonda Thomas. I think a book has just come out about that this year or late last year about Clemson's desegregation, okay. uh, which is, um, I think, a, a pretty good book from what I've seen. Um, now, I can't claim to know too much about Clemson's desegregation movement. Um, the thing about that, though, is that it does take place a few months after USC segregation. Um, and again, it's an example that's brought up by leaders in South Carolina of the state doing it the right way. They're saying, hey, look at how we peacefully segregated Clemson and USC without the violence that happened at UGA or Alabama or University of Mississippi just a year before that. Um, by the way, and, and I, I don't normally do this, uh, but speaking of school segregation, uh, there is a book coming out this fall um, that I co-edited that is about the Black experience at the University of South Carolina. Um, it's a collection of essays. Um, it's right now it's titled Indivisible No More, African Americans at the University of South Carolina. Um, <clears throat> it's coming out in October, November of this year. Uh, but it's a collection of essays about not just the segregation at USC in the 60s, but it goes back to the reconstruction period. It's about Black students there. I actually have a chapter in the book about the earlier attempts to segregate USC in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and early 1960s that all to varying degrees didn't work. Um, so again, a lot of this history is, is very fascinating um, and more of it is of course uh, coming to light. 
Now, Melissa asked a question about recommendations on reading and resources that discuss the South as a testing ground for bigoted policy. <clears throat> Great question. Uh, I know that Ian mentioned in the, in the chat, Hammer and Ho by Robin D.G. Kelly, an excellent book that you should check out, especially interested in activism during the early civil rights era. Um, I was also going to recommend a few other books. Now, for one thing, the Modesto School website has a lot of good resources that deal with just what you're talking about. Many of them are about South Carolina specifically, but they do also extrapolate talking about how what's happening in South Carolina is affecting the South more broadly. Um, another, I'm just gonna give you a couple quick reading recommendations. Uh, it's a little outdated, but I think it's still pretty good. Uh, now this book was referred to as the Bible of the Civil Rights Movement, and that is C. Van Woodward's Strange Career of Jim Crow. Uh, which actually first came out in the late 50s and had several updates in the 60s and 70s. Now, Woodward, of course, being one of the major uh, Southern historians of the late 20th century. Um, another book I want to uh, recommend, and this is going back to Ella Baker. This is more about activism, but I highly recommend it. Um, it's called, it's by Barbara Ransby. It's called Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision. Um, let's see. So those are just a couple of resources. Uh, there is much more with the Majestic School that we already have online and you'll also see posted in the weeks to come. Those are a couple of good places to start. I really recommend A Strange Career of Jim Crow. Um, even though the book's a bit older, it was a book being read by civil rights activists in the 60s. So if you're wondering how Martin Luther King and others promulgated some of their strategies and tactics, and use that in their speeches about Jim Crow segregation. They're basing it in large part on that one book, Strange Career of Jim Crow. Um, but I just wanna throw it out there as, as a couple of resources. And then finally, I'll mention one last book. I'll hold it up to the screen and put it in the chat. Uh, one of my favorites, Jane Crow, The Life of Pauli Murray. Uh, speaking of folks we don't talk about nearly enough, um, Pauli Murray was one of the great activists in the, the mid to late 20th century who spoke out on civil rights, on human rights, on, on, on gender rights and the like. And she was certainly uh, instrumental in a lot of the things we're talking about this evening in terms of creating a legal strategy against segregation, but also supporting direct action tactics. And I'll put that, that link in the chat as well. And by the way, one quick uh, factoid about Pauli Murray, uh, if you've heard of her before, you may not know that she actually taught at Benedict College for a year uh, in 1968 or so. Uh, and then she was run out of town because she was a bit too radical for Benedict's leadership. Um, all right, so we've got plenty of things in the chat going on here. Let's see if I can find some more questions. There are some really fascinating comments uh, in the chat. Let's see. Um, now, one thing I do want to point out, too, is I, I don't want folks, to, I've seen a few folks in the chat mention how tonight's conversation in, in particular feels a little dispiriting. And as a historian, I can tell you, learning and writing and researching a lot of this can be difficult. It, it can be hard. But you should also take solace in the fact that these people kept fighting despite the odds, that there are people in this class with us right now who've been fighting for decades um, for the kind of society we want to see, a just, equitable, decent society that treats everyone fairly and equally, one that we still aren't quite there yet, but we're still working on it uh, today. Let me see, let's see. Okay, so I see Michael has a question. Uh, learning from the past, strategically or organizationally, what do you think are some options to tackle what will be the continued use of Tim Scott to deflect and affect rape? <laughs> it seems one way to break this play is to show him there are consequences, primarily by him losing his seat. Now, I think that that's, that's one way to do it. Um, I, I think, just not to go too off on a tangent here about black conservatism, um, you do see the Republican Party today, they are promoting more 
candidates of color across the country. Uh, you have Mia Love of Utah, for example. Uh, you have Tim Scott right here in South Carolina. Um, they're also trying to make inroads with the Latino community as well. Um, so I think the, the best answer to your question, Michael, about Tim Scott, and this, this isn't really going to be anything that's, that's radical, but I, I think it's continued organizing within the state, uh, not just for the sake of getting more votes, but making it clear to folks like Tim Scott and others in the state government that there are a lot of South Carolinians who simply don't agree with what they're saying about, well, just about anything. But I, I think what makes Scott so interesting is that he is, as you're pointing out, he is used to really talk about issues of race in a way that gets the Republican Party off the hook in a lot of ways. Um, and, and certainly in the last week or so, we've seen this with the critiques by conservatives of things like critical race theory, for example. Uh, I know that Brett and I were talking this afternoon about the class who were discussing the boogeyman of history, right? And how they often use socialism, communism. Um, and right now it seems they're also using critical race theory as a boogeyman to scare folks into voting for the Republican party and supporting more conservative policies. We've also seen this with the attacks on the 1619 project. Uh, now I'm not gonna get my high horse here, but from what I've seen so far of critiques from the right of both the 1619 project and the critical, and critical race theory, to put it mildly, I don't think they've done much of the reading because oftentimes what they're creating are actually caricatures of what these things actually are. But that's the thing is that's dangerous. They can create caricatures of actual belief systems, ideology, systems of thought, and they become very effective in the political arena because they're designed just to whip people up into a, an emotional blur to do things that are not in their own interest. Okay, I know I'm talking a bit too much here. Um, Omari has, as always, Omari has some really interesting questions here. Um, what is the activism today? What old school tactic would, would you bridge with this era? We're in a space of a Derek Chauvin verdict and new shootings the same day, same week. What do your students ask in terms of direction? What expanded protests would, would, your hip, would hip your students to beyond law enforcement? Where are new old battle lines being redrawn? Okay. That's, those are some really interesting questions. And what I love about Omari's questions, he, he always asks questions that could be entire classes by themselves. Um, and I think th this is some food for thought for all of us here. I, I think one way to answer your question, Omari, is that just speaking as a historian for a moment, in previous eras of activism, many of those folks who were involved in, say, the, the SNYC or in the anti-lynching crusades generation before, or after that, the SNCC, things like that. What they're often trying to do is they're trying to find the tactics that best work for the conflict they find themselves in. So for instance, the NAACP in the 30s was pursuing a legal strategy, a legal campaign, because they felt that was the best way to go forward. Whereas the SNYC was saying, that's, that's nice for you guys to do that, but we're going to pursue direct action movements. We're going to pursue alliances with socialists and communists and other radicals. Uh, whereas in the 60s, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is saying, we believe that direct action tactics are the way to go. So to answer your question, Amari, in, in a broad sense, there is no one answer, I would argue, legitimate answer for, for tactics in terms of activism. But what you have to be willing to do is to be flexible uh, in terms of how you pursue the kind of change you wish to see in the world. That it might take fighting through the courts in one, in one arena, it may take direct action protests in another, it could be jail, no bail in one sense, it could be um, galvanizing voters for an election. It could take any number of forms. In the 60s, civil rights and black power activists alike try just about everything they could. I think that would be the same thing we do now. We try using social media, we try old fashioned tactics, we do whatever it takes to make the world we live in just a little more bearable for everyone. Let me add something to that that's so important, and I hope it's something that we can uncover well enough for people to embrace, is that tactics without strategy isn't functional. 
that protest without a goal that is the protest leverages is just an expression of individual anger. And so the whole notion of having a strategic force that works together, all the things are legitimate tactics in certain circumstances. And you don't want to be a one trick pony. You want to be able to do everything you need to do to be able to reach as many people as you can. And if you study war and effective, you know, effective organizers of war, you, you learn that um, one of the things that the, that the Germans did so well in their propaganda was understanding neurolinguistics, that they could speak and the people could hear them. They could talk in a way that you could see it. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you see it? Can you hear it? And talking to people that they can hear in language that they can feel and not being too polemic and not being too caught up in promoting yourself with your postulations and protest. So we just have to be really smarter than they are. We can't outshoot them. We can't outspend them. We've got to out clever them and build a movement that you feel comfortable in. And it's a safe space for you to feel and express what you feel. And we'll figure out how to get there. Okay? Stay with us. All right. So I think that's, um, I think that's about it for this evening. Um, well, Robert, I want to, before we break and we, we're going to have a musical interlude, it looks like everybody's asked their questions. And this, I've been really, really sad that I can't like get together and hang out with you guys and get to know each one of you. There are going to be people that pass through here like ships in the, in the darkness. So if you, I would like for those that have some time, to stay and, and introduce themselves and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, and this is what I like to do and what I'm afraid of or what I love. And uh, if you don't have questions, stay and, and we'll chat for 15 or 20 minutes after, the, after this rousing musical interlude when Dr. Green excuses the class, there's time for you to go to the bathroom and, and get a beverage. Take us home, Robert. All right, well, once again, folks, uh, thanks so much for another wonderful edition of the Majesta School. Again, this school doesn't exist without your participation and support. Um, Brett, do you have something else to? Oh, okay. Uh, we, and... we forgot to mention the next Monday's class. Mm -hmm. And uh, Becky, do you want to say something about next Monday's class? Becky's shaking her head. <laughs> Becky's saying no. Um, we're going to have a discussion amongst some old time activists about how you pick your allies and how you pick your enemy. And we find, we're going to find different people with the, pretty much the same conclusion is that the enemy of my enemy is my ally. And if we get too picky, we end up fighting with our allies. And so it's a question of the silos and organizing around personal identities and things that we're going to broach a difficult and sometimes touchy su subject next, next Monday with Mandy Carter, who's a, an organizer that's been in the trenches from the, from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 60s being a, a Nobel nominated uh, laureate, uh, known depending on which decade you knew her as an anti-war activist. Uh, she's one of the leaders of the lesbian movement in America, started the Southerners on a New Ground. That's uh, a wonderful so Southern organization doing great organizing. Joined with Kevin Gray and um, who am I leaving out, Becky? Kevin and Mandy and... Megan. Megan, Megan Kane, and uh, Megan's in a different, a different that's a different one. That's a different one. Megan's later down the road. Well, anyway, we'll be sending out information on that, so stay tuned. I'm sorry. All right, and again, that's that's our deeper dive for next week, and then the week after that, we'll be getting into class six, which uh, really deals with South Carolina in, in the late '60s, '70s, '80s, and '90s. Really, get from the Vietnam War era protests that took place in the state of South Carolina to the formation of GROW and to the eventual formation of the progressive network itself. Again, like everything else, that too also has a history. So I think for those of you, especially who were talking about activism in the chat, who are really concerned about, well, what do I do from here? Then you really want to join us next Monday for that deeper dive into tactics involved in activism. All right. So Again, we're going to have our uh, musical interlude. And as one of my favorite fictional characters says, until next time, live long and prosper. R-E-S-P-C-T. You get what you work for. I'm, I, this, I have no idea that there's 28 of you that feel as lonely as I do. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm just going to like call out people. James DeWeese, I happen to know that your son is a chip off some block. Is that you? 
uh, if if James can figure out how to unmute himself, we're going to find out. Hey, Brett. And your daughter is your daughter has your daughter been with us tonight? Yes, she's uh, had to put her kids to bed, but she's yes, been sir. with us every week. Uh, James is the uh, father of uh, Daniel DeWeese, who is the other modestly paid person that helps with the Progressive Network. Thank you, James, for lending your son and, and your daughter. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. And just a little bit. I'm almost as old as you. Uh, it's been a, in 64. I was in high school in Atlanta when Lester Maddox started his craze. Yeah, yeah. And the next year, 65, moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. So I saw the changing of the ways in school in both of those towns and then moved to Columbia in 66 at Old Columbia High School and saw the changes there. Uh, next week when we talk about the 68 have a new unique perspective on the vietnam protests being a veteran i was in the u.s army reserves during that protest starting in carolina mm -hmm. go to school during the day and then on the uh, bowl and senate street at night when the curfew was on uh, and uh worked seven years at state hospital. So it's been an interesting life for me and I'm lucky to have a daughter and a son that feel the way I do about social justice. And I'm so proud of them and proud to be a student at Majeska Simpson School. Thank you. Well, thank you, James. We're, we're, we're honored to have you. Omar, take over and run the show here for me. You're a good MC. How are we going to get these people to say something before it gets to be midnight? <laughs> All right, boys and girls, what's your favorite color? <laughs> Green. All right, there it is. I just wanted to share quick a story about um school board meeting last week that I was at um, where, you know, parents are wanting no masking and teachers are wanting masks, most teachers. And um, for the second time in, a, in maybe a couple months, the same parent um, refers to me as the activist, that teacher activist as a bad thing. And so when you keep talking about activists, I mean, I was very proud of my new name that I was given by, by the mean parent in the room. Um, I don't know why he he perceives that as a negative, but um, I feel like we all should be activists for our profession. And um, if you're not, then what are you doing there? Where do you teach? I teach in Dorchester District Two. I'm in Somerville, and um, I'm the the president of our local. My camera's here, but you all are here, so that's why I'm looking this way. Oh. <laughs> I'm the president of the Somerville Education Association and we're part of the SCEA, part of the NEA. And so we get up and give a report every once in a while. And, you know, we do, we talk about some of the things we'd like to see happening in the district. And there's, um, there's a, a small but loud parent group that doesn't like me, but they call me an activist. And I'm like, yes, my mission is complete. <laughs> I was I was down in, in Charleston until this this past year. Uh, hasn't hasn't there, there been like a big push with the Dorchester school districts as, as far as like uh, getting a lot of like funding uh, shifted around? I, I I forget the exact uh, like controversy, but there's there's been a huge like shift up uh, in in the last like year or two, right? Well, I think you might be talking about. Um, I just actually was multitasking while we had our class, uh, the budget and, and we we suffer a lot from um, we per pupil expenditure and we don't get much money because we're a bedroom community and we don't have a whole lot of businesses. So, um, you know, like Charleston County gets about 18,000 per student and we get like 10. We're below the state average of 14,000 per student. So yeah, there's tons of money that 
that are, you know, the equity is not there. And so that is, a, again, every year around this time when it's budget season for schools, it comes up and it's, it's here again. So that's probably, that might be what you're referring to. But I've enjoyed the class and I am an activist, so I'm happy. Miko, you were sounding like you were close to burning out there. Uh, you tell us that you're not flaming out. You know what? I was really close because um, every Monday is hard. Like at first, but you know, the first the first week it's like yes, yes, and then like every Monday I find myself just trying to prepare myself for six thirty. Like like because. And then I, I do not do anything after class, nothing, but get a drink. Um, so it, it's just been really hard. And then, you know, a lot of what I'm learning, I'm actually seeing in my own experience. And amen, sister, being an activist, because I put that on title on myself, um, because, you know, we built this Time for Change organization, and um, I actually had whomever tried to send a plant into my organization. And I had to have Black Voters Matter um, kind of coach me on what to say once we identified this person was an African-American woman and a complete fake. Um, you know, so hearing like some of these tactics that was used back in the day, and then my current experience and the DMs that I get, you know, it's like, it's real hard. It's the, like physically right now, I am raw on the inside. And this is every Monday, you know? So I appreciate, you know, Dr. Green saying, hey, I'm a historian. <laughs> and um, he has to study this stuff all the time and, and teach it over and over again. So I figure if he can do it, then I can make it to the end of the class. And I know I'm going to be better at the end, but um, it's hard. It's hard, Brett. Well, Mika, how long have you been in South Carolina? Not long. <laughs> I moved here. Well, I don't want to say you're going to get used to it, but it's rough. Well, I moved here in 2016, but, you know, my husband is originally from South Carolina and we have, um, you know, I've been coming here our whole marriage. We've been married over 30 years. But things changed once I started working, once we moved here in 2016 and I started working with disaster recovery and I started telling African-Americans to vote, you know, and I ran for office, you know, and here's the crazy thing is there's people, politicians and such and other people who won't be seen with me, like literally won't be seen with me. They will call me, they will text me, and, and they will tell me, don't say anything, don't tell anybody that I said you that I said this. You know, don't want to be seen in pictures. And then there's other people who will come to me, find me just to take a picture with me to use it. I don't know they're using it as a weapon or whatever, but I don't care. You know, um, it's just we've had the in the last mayor race, the current sitting mayor stood across the street from us on top of his trunk with a phone snapping pictures of us and our volunteers and our setup you know it's like dude just come over and talk to us face to face you know these people and the fear that they have that african americans will wake up in the community that i live in where 70 percent african americans it's it's just beyond frustrating. Well, stay with us, Miko. We need your insight and your support. Mitzi, you've exposed yourself. Is that because you've got something to say? No, not particularly. I was just, <laughs> I thought that a well, face we, for Miko and a supportive face of, of we hear you and, you know. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. Not, I won't put you on the spot. doing what you do. Um, you know, it's, I can't imagine. Um, I was talking to a woman in the grocery store about it the other day during the George Floyd stuff. Um, she was like, as a black woman, I don't want to have to watch this. And I was like, I think as a white woman, I should have to pay tribute to the history and the suffering of the people that have come before mm -hmm. us because I've never, you know, I've, I've never had to live that experience every day. So I thought I would just turn my camera on. So. Keith has a hand up. 
I'd like to compliment Nico for keeping up, <laughs> hanging in there. I mean, it, this has been so dark, this history that I've been learning about these. And, and I don't have to deal with it every day. And it's still so dark and depressing. But I'm going to hang in there and try to pay forward. Hey, I wanted to say to the people, um, the flip side of what you're experiencing is, you know, at least there's a group to check in with. You know, we, all, we say beloved community a lot, but oftentimes we'll just call each other and when we could meet in person and especially with, you know, our venue under construction on um, Elmwood, the goal is that that would be a huddle house for people to just be in community and check in at an emotional level to check in about your politics and such. Um, from, from experience in the field, I know what it's like to be a, a Kumya versus a Benya, you know, a visitor to a community. And at first I didn't understand the politics. I used to just look at stuff and be like, okay, we should clearly be waging war against X, Y, and Z. But sometimes when people who, who have grown up in that community and they got to negotiate all those politics, like I understand there is backlash that comes with coming forward, not even as radical, but just as a thinker, period. So it's like, I think you're doing the right thing, like at least creating a safe space for them to be able to check in with you and um, respecting the, you know, their politics of either one to be seen with you or not. So I can relate. Um, just be careful about, you know, self-care. Now I know that's a big thing that's coming on in activism now. So health and wellness and just doing what you gotta do to be the best human being you can. I think that means having a team around you and being able to, to rest. But um, a question I wanted to pose to the floor is, um, what are your, uh, what's your activism? I think there's different levels to it. Some people just want to contribute financially. Some people just want to be boots on the ground. Um, some people want to take like the deeper dive that we might take with some of our Bear Maps work. So what is, what's the point of entry into this work that um, you all feel you can do at the, at the best pitch you're able to offer at a given moment? That's a very good question. Um, good evening, everyone. This is Jennifer Clobin Reed. I cannot turn on my camera because my hair is all over the place. But um, just wanted to touch base. Miko, you know how I feel about you. You are um, the best advocate for the people in your area, and they just don't realize it yet. That's all it is. Um, and once they get come to that realization, I think everything will go smoothly. Um, I do want to shout out to the teachers. Um, as a former educator, it is Teacher Appreciation Month, and we do appreciate everything you're doing. And being an advocate for the children in your classroom is your primary goal, and that is all. And that is all. We don't apologize for that, and we cannot do so. Um, and the other thing that Omari was talking about, I think I put it in the chat, everyone has a role to play. I just would like to see that everyone's role is respected. Just because you feel that someone needs to be in a particular space or place doesn't mean that that is their strength. And it should be okay that they work in whatever area that they are comfortable as long as they are working. So for me, um, you'll see in the coming weeks that I will be um, putting forth uh, launching um, a particular space for anyone who wants to help with getting South Carolina to be the best that she can be. And details will be coming out later, but, um, but I, I do, I will appreciate everyone's um, input. Um, when we do have that space. I want to also say that I have office space on Gervais Street in Columbia. It is a huge space where we can all come together and meet. I'm fully vaccinated. If you're fully vaccinated, you're welcome. Um, but, you know, anytime that we think that we need to get together and we need the space, 
I have the space. So I vote for film night. I want to see Judas and the Black Messiah. So get a screen and make that real. I have an 80 inch TV. Whoa. We Damn. can get it on that. We can put it in the in the middle room there in the conference area. We can watch it. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I, had to, I had to watch that twice. That was deep. <laughs> that was deep. That's Three right. Times, I'm good. I watched water. it the third and the fourth time. I'm ready. Water, water and escape. What's your politics? Yep. I would like to answer Omari's question where I'm what how much I can put in. Uh, I'm the Lancaster County Democratic Party chair. And yeah, probably got a few strange looks on that one. But uh, I've been radicalized for a long time and I'm trying to play inside outside game. I work with our revolution, South Carolina. I have just recently retired, which means I have a whole lot more time to be out on the streets. And I'm trying to build networks of cooperation between all the groups because I see all of us as allies. Some people are focused on very specific uh, issues and others have a broader range, but we can all amplify our voices by just communicating with each other and saying, hey, we got this rally or we, we've just posted this or we, we're gonna do this Zoom town hall and it, the more people that pile on, the better. Thank you. Caroline, you haven't said anything. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn. Um, nice to meet y'all. I'm just here to learn. I'm really grateful to be around so many smart people who are doing a lot of great things. Um, I live in Columbia, and I went to school here, and I grew up in South Carolina. So. Um, and you're still here. Still here. Believe most it or not. <laughs> the problem has been for generations that most of the smart people leave. <laughs> They're run out, no, run out of the state. I mean, I, I grew up here, they kill black people and they threaten white people with long jail sentences if they don't leave. And so we're really grateful for those that do stay and fight. And certainly the comebacks, which uh, Brother brother Fox mentioned and, and Gene Hammock is one of them. Y'all come back now because we need you. So Carolyn, we appreciate you being here. I'm gonna call on Christine because I did, I need to hear Christine's voice. Right. Um, yes, in answer to Omari's question, I try to work a lot in voting. Um, I work at the polls and write lots of op-eds. I'm down here in Charleston um, about voting and I'm trying to figure out I would love to not do my day job and be able to do more in activism, but I'm trying to figure out a way that that those two things work together. Um, and thinking so much about, I don't know, a lot of people here are involved in education, but it impresses me so much that we need to get the things that we're learning here to a younger group. We need to bring this, into the high schools and the middle schools somehow. And if anybody knows how I can help in doing that or has some inroads to that, I would just love to, to help. I mean, I, I've been in Charleston for 33, 34 years, but I grew up in the North and it impressed me that growing up, I never heard any of this history. Of course, I never even knew that is reconstruction because it you know none of us who are of a certain age even heard of that in the north and it's you know to, to Miko's point where everything is such a downer we also need to be bringing up the fact that we had a few years where things actually semi worked and you know I don't know just teaching teaching younger people about all these things is, just seems really important to me. So anyway, I'm throwing that out there, but I love the class. I love learning all this stuff and I you know, want to help however I can. And this is Peter. 
Yeah, and you're a cat person. I see one crawling around Caroline. I've got one that keeps walking across my keyboard that's black and I haven't seen it yet. So there's something about cat people here. But Christine, we one of the, the, the concepts of the Majeska School is predicated on this old um, revolutionary uh, slogan, education is the placenta of the state. And so being stupid isn't an accident. There are people that benefit from it and have benefited from it for several hundred years. And I, I'm, I'm sorry that South Carolina's history seems to be so dark, but it's so important that we learn the heavy hand that history in South Carolina has had not just on South Carolina, not just on the United States, but on the world. Mm -hmm. And as we move through the courses here, we'll sum that up, but it's pretty remarkable. And so what I take from that is a, a sense of, um, uh, of, of responsibility but also a one of you know a kind of a great historical leverage that this is that we've got we've got to do something about this and so this is what we're about and we want to do the um the get to the youth i want the majestic school to be you know uh pre, pre k through post doc uh we're basically doing what now right now we consider to be the graduate level course and that we want to build a base of people that understand it support it that can help us share it so you can go out and start something in the, in the high school and in the elementary school, we have a number of people that have been, they're graduates or so elementary school principals, PhDs in early childhood education. We've got, we've got the pieces. We don't have the staff capacity to put them together. And so we're slowly building that and looking. We want to become a real threat, actually, is what we want to do to the, to the system. I got a question. So what's the deal with uh, South Carolina ETV? You made it really clear in terms of how it stands separately from other uh, states in terms of their autonomy. Um, how come this program, or let's say this course, is not offered in a, in a shorter or uh, a, a, a more a, a, a way in which that could be streamed or seen on ETV. One of the things I noticed today, I was watching a show called The Origin of Everything, and it's actually a um, it's an online uh, program, and it's only about five or ten minutes. But it was, for example, they take very heavy questions like the origin of racism, the origin of slavery, and it's done succinctly with a young woman on screen, and she just gives an overview and a history, of course, with the other graphics, but it's presented and published by PBS. And so I thought, wow, that was very smart of them to create that type of programming that is reaching out to young people. And it's the YouTube, it's available on YouTube, the origin of everything. And some classes have actually used it because she made note of it in her uh, presentation that thank a uh, shout out to one of the schools. But I thought, well, why isn't something like that created and, and, and circulated on the ETV? Well, Jackie, South that Carolina, is, presented a, by the progressive, uh, by you all. Well, that's an excellent question. But the problem is, is that the fact that, the, that we're the only state that the people own the system, we paid for it. But we're also the only state that the legislature controls all the licenses. And so the creative and, and educational capacity of SCETV is directly related to the lowest IQ of 170 legislators. And that we have, we have in our pantheon of history, a list of things that they won't, don't wanna talk about. One of the most perfect examples is in the late 1980s. Um, we get visited at our building at Grove before we were doing the network by people that were making a film about the uprising of 34, which is a great textile strike, largest strike ever in the nation from Maine to, to Georgia of textile mills, which were the backbone of the economy. In Hania Pass, South Carolina, there were um, seven people killed and a whole bunch of people wounded. And they were making a film of it because nobody knew about it. And that they, in, in the making of the film, they interviewed people that lived there. And one of the people that I met and spent some time with since then, Frank Beecham, was the grandson of the mill manager that had a militia that he hired that killed the people. And there's footage in this film, the uprising of 34, that's just incredible. The 10,000 people come to the funeral and things like that. Frank Beecham, the grandson of the, may, of the guy that owned the mill that called the, 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 his goons in, grew up in Hania Path. 
he never heard of it. So when ETV, PBS, does this nationwide broadcast about this thing that's never talked about in South Carolina, guess what state didn't show that film? Mm-hmm. Bingo, you got it. So that's the answer to your question. Next question. So is that the status <laughs> of South Carolina ETV today? I mean, yes. in terms yes, of, ma'am. I don't know who, yes, ma'am. who yes, runs ma'am. it, but I, I do know some people that work there, huh? No, and I am persona non grata there because I have to talk bad about the, the system they're really good people, clever people, capable people, artistic people that are constrained by the same things I talk about. They don't want to talk about them because they can't make it go away. It's up to us to make it go away. The, the, the legislature has a hold on everything in this state because the way the system was designed for them to have a hold on everything in this state. And we're the, the most legislative state in the nation because Ben Tillman, who wrote the Constitution, was so afraid the governor in South Carolina could be black because the statewide district is the only one they couldn't gerrymander. They put all the all the decisions, all the power into the 46 white senators. You, if you've ever watched a movie about Southern, you know, politics, you know about Boss Hogg. Each yeah. each county had one senator. That one senator they appointed three trustworthy white people to run the elections, and they ran the county and they ran the city. And it wasn't until 1970, and then it took several years to where even the counties and cities could have elect, elect their own government, they're not appointed by the senators. And so we're just barely crawling out of the 18th century here, my dear. And so right now, the, the stranglehold, this is dark. I'm sorry, folks, this is the reality we're living with. But maybe learning helps empower us. But the circumstance we have is so outrageous that I'm hoping that more people learn about it the more friends we'll have and the more people we'll have in real life. <laughs> well, Brett, then maybe we have to do small baby steps. What's your social media platform like with well, Twitter, that's... et cetera? I mean, you can almost talk to anybody that way. And boy, wouldn't they love to get a notice from you every week about this is what happened in South Carolina. Well, you're right, Jackie. We, 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 need, we need staff. We need money. Becky Robbins, who has left her chair here, has been the communications director since we started the Progressive Network. Becky has finished her master's degree, master's work at the University of South Carolina a long time ago. 1991, she couldn't get a story written, and she came in to grow where we had a statewide newspaper, and we let her run the story. She became the editor. She checked in. She never left. Uh, a number of years later, um, we, we were married. So we're, this is a full disclosure here. Becky and I are the, the, the mom and pop operation here. We're we're running this whole operation on what's less than one salary. Well, we'll some, help you. Some I mean, really, everybody else has a social media Excellent. platform. Excellent, Jackie. You're you're on. You're on. And so yeah. Becky will be in touch. And what we what we're hoping is that by the end of this class, the people that want to do something, the last two classes are talking about what are you going to do. Now, if you just want to be an effective citizen, go off and vote better and raise hell with your neighbors and your family. That's super. We need that. You could be an effective citizen working at Walmart as a greeter a teacher, a banker, but there's some people that have more time, they want to be more organizers, and we want them to take a practicum, to do something. And well, that's help, what I helping, want to do, because helping honestly, do, helping I have short posted, videos is, is an excellent thing to do. I have posted some of the information that we have shared or learned in class. For example, uh, uh, I, I made note about South Carolina being mm-hmm. the only colony that was designed specifically for slavery and how, uh, you know, I had just come back from Barbados, as a matter of fact, about nine months ago. And so I wanted to let everybody know about the, the connection. And boy, the conversation that that elicited, I mean, people who came back and said, I always wanted to know about why Barbados seems so closely aligned with South Carolina. My relatives are there and I see the connection, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just saying, that's the information, put it out there. You got social media now that really people uh, from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram, it would be so much easier to at least let the information flow and let people be able to hear, comment, and to become a, a discussion with the Progressive Network. I, 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 it, it's easy enough. I would love to have seen the Progressive Network hit back with Nikki Haley and Tim Scott when they made the comments they did with some facts. You could have come back and said, just a notation. I mean, because that would have carried, and can you imagine all of the others that are reading that would have picked up and could have lifted your comments and taken them into another realm, be it you and on media or any of the shows that I'm watching. I, I want to see the information dispersed in bigger places in other ways. 
Well, Jackie, you're, you're breaking Becky's heart because that's what she's been talking about for years now about us using social media. The problem is, is uh, I don't do it, and we got a couple people that are like spend a lot of time helping us, and they don't do it, and so we're missing that boat. And so, oh, congratulations, Mario, congratulations, doing, Jackie. Social media, you're, aren't you on Twitter? Okay. Where Dr. Just, Green at? <laughs> can I just say a couple words about that, Jackie? I would invite you to look at the things that we already do have in place um, in terms of the Progressive Network. We have um, a Facebook page, a Facebook group. Um, the Majestic oh. School's got its own Facebook. Page okay, well. I'm gonna follow you. <laughs> um, we've got a YouTube channel for the uh, that has a playlist of all of the classes here that are recorded, and the ones that are the deeper dives, like the one next week and the one last week, between the regular classes, are open to the public. So I'd invite you to to when we send out a link to that information that you share with your circles of anybody that you think might be interested, and they can join us next week and in any of these other classes and at some point we're also going to be adding things like skills workshops that'll be open to folks as well um, okay we Becky, then, then, yeah. then then hit us all so that we can all follow you on any social media send us your links i mean seriously because i would have really done that i'm that initiator and i certainly would have loved to have dropped that dime on the pay i follow nikki haley like basically i'm i i, I i'm just behind her i want to be that girl is just on her nerves so mm. i follow her and leave comments and i would have loved to have left a link to say oh it's like this country, well, let's go for a little history here. Obviously, you and the president are missing out on this. <laughs> Jackie, one of the things that's obvious to me is that that uh, Tim Scott didn't pay attention in school in South Carolina, nope, or they didn't all. teach him, because when he said that we're not a racist, a racist country, he could talk about everywhere else but South Carolina. This is the only place that was created with the express purpose. Of you know of, of holding up chattel slavery. Exactly. We okay, even okay, started okay. a damn war in 1861 to do it, and and we got you know that 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 legend lives on, but we 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 did not. I want to quote Gilda Cobb Hunter here, who's one of our founders. Gilda came into the legislature here in '92, and was with us when we started the Progressive Network, and we've done some really remarkable things that nobody hears about. So we I kind of get like burned out at even trying to communicate outside to people that are willing to hear because we didn't set out to be a secret society. Uh, the day after Trump was inaugurated, we hosted an event in Columbia in the rain. Um, because it was raining, we rented a big facility next door to the state house that would only hold 2,000 people. We had 2,000 people outside in the rain. At 4,000 people there, about 40 organizations, an incredible event. State newspaper, front page news, two pages of story, never mentioned the Progressive Network. And so, <laughs> There's something to be said about the fact of being effective and you're threatening people. That's part of what we're learning here about resistance and oppression. And so we, we do need to, to share and spread out the resistance so they can't nip it in the bud. But we also have to have the capacity to do that. And we've been running, let me tell you that North Carolina and Georgia, uh, they have twice as much money coming in doing the type of work we're doing. There's not any indigenous money in South Carolina. And there are probably a dozen organizations that I know the directors of in both Raleigh and Atlanta that are doing a piece of what we're doing with multi-million dollar budgets and multiple staff. There's no progressive infrastructure in South Carolina. And we've been holding it together for 50 years here by perseverance. And uh, we, the GROW that started the network started a cafe, a newspaper, a print shop, and we, we, we subsidized our own social justice habit. And so it's time for other people to step up. It's time for us to get some fresh blood and to raise some hell and, and make good trouble. And so you're on, Jackie. We'll be visiting you right shortly. So who haven't we heard from? Right, Robert Miko, we got you back. We got you back, Miko. Have a good night. I know you got to run. You got to go, Miko. We'll be in touch. Good night, Miko. I, I don't have much to share but just to say a i too was a bit overwhelmed with the initial historical context going into it um and i've shared this in other spaces that i actively don't participate in black pain or black suffering and that to remember though as we're learning this history there's a lot of black joy and black love that was happening in these spaces there was relationships being made there was families being made there was just hot hookups happening there was a god there was a lot of joy that was happening in these spaces as well and but also carrying a lot of this heavy information 
as long as it's purposeful, that if we utilize that has been bestowed upon us, that this information, as we're learning about the historical context of how work is happening, even seeing the similarities and the parallels to what is happening today, there is still an arc of growth and there's an arc of justice in that we in this space, I mean, there's a reality that 30 years ago, this space may not existed in the way it exists. So understanding that is happening and understanding that we're in this moment of cultural shift, it is empowering. And I will answer Amari's question really quickly. I don't self-identify as an activist in spaces. I come in and talk about being an abolitionist. I'm not trying to activate any type of system. I'm being trying to deconstruct the system. I believe in the spaces that we are in are inherently patriarchal and racist. And because it is that, South Carolina created to be a racist state, one of the first states to have the largest amount of indigenous of slaves and largest amount of um, stolen people from the continent of Africa. Like it is a place of injust and it is a place but in that place, there's also so much beauty and so much realness that interconnects us. So I am trying to reconstruct a new South, a South on hollow ground, a South on new ground, Southerners on new ground, <laughs> Mandy Carter. So I am trying to build that world and I'm trying to do it with as many dope ass folks as I can find to make this uh, happen. And the last thing I'm gonna throw out there is about I, I think one of the tools that we have is this political education and we can do it in like magazines or zines. I think what Ms. Jackie has been talking about using the social media platform, it is bestowed upon the folks who run the progressive network to also expand. Like Brett was saying, it is about expansion and it's about an inflection of new folks and new ideas and new um, spaces to come in to be able to elevate it and move these conversations forward because there is going to be a part where it has to be actionable right there's a part that once you get all this information and we are now sitting in these spaces to collect this what are we going to do with it how would we go and make good trouble how do we move forward to be progressive and not wither on the vine and be a raisin in the sun all right Lorraine Hansberry I've been I was reading a lot today so utilizing that space is utilizing those information then that's how we're going to progress and that's how we're going to be able to whether it's fighting gerrymandering, whether it is going to be in the various ways in electoral process, there are ways that we can be powerful and take what we need as our communities and be the leaders that we need to be. And I'm gonna do it through abolitionists. All of you are gonna do it through all other kinds of ways, but it is gonna be in a confluence because our myceliums are gonna connect and this work is going to be profound because y'all are participating in it and you are all profound people. You are blessed people. So I'm, I'm just excited that we're doing this and that's all I have to say. And Robert John was that third person I couldn't remember that's going to help with our conversation next Monday when we talk about finding allies. And Robert John has been the song, really great organization, doing organizing for a long time. And Robert John's come home, come home all the way to, to, to Redneck <laughs> Casey, South Carolina, and we're going to keep him here. And so thank you, Robert John. You're so welcome. All my people are here, so I had to come back. <laughs> I hear you. We're going to keep you and who hadn't said something? Is, is, is Dr. Gallman still out there hiding behind that still picture? Yeah, actually, yeah. I, I was trying to get in, but um, the conversation was so fascinating that I said, let me just shut up and listen. Ah. <laughs> I, um, as a person who grew up in the rural South, and the realities that seemed so dark to everybody else was a reality. It wasn't dark or, or, or light or mm -hmm. it was just reality. And uh, so um, from having been involved in an organization that was uh, creating study groups for the past 30 years, one of the things that we see is that um, just like people react to death in stages, people react to this information and hit, especially historical information in stages. Um, and, and depending on the individual, is depending on the, the order of stages. It can go from depression to anger, to resignation, to, to activism, or some other uh, order of those things. Uh, the thing that I have always tried to 
talk people down from is the anger because uh, anger can sometimes produce hate and that doesn't solve anything. In fact, it creates more problems. So understanding that um, uh, the hypocrisy involved in racism, you know, um, I think about Strom Thurmond who was a daytime segregationist and uh, looking at, at, at that and understanding um, what we're against and that is fear, it is fear. Um, one of the, my, uh, I can't call her a teacher because I didn't get a chance to spend that much time with her, but in studying her work, uh, Francis Cress Welsing was a psychiatrist who actually had some very, very interesting um, thoughts about racism being a, a white fear of annihilation in terms of just the genetic aspects of, of um, the one drop rule. Hmm. So, um, you know, I guess that's, that's enough. <laughs> uh, those are just some thoughts that, are, that, that crossed my mind, but I'm really enjoying the class. Unfortunately, I've had to miss several classes and I was uh, very late today. So I'm looking forward to going on to the uh, website and looking at these uh, classes later. This is Dr. Gallman's second uh, second session with us. We expect him to come back again. He's a sponge. I'll be back. He'll be back. Oh yeah. It's getting late, folks. But uh, if somebody hadn't said something, speak up. I don't know who's still here that hadn't said something. But I really do appreciate you spending time with us because what we're missing. This is the first time that we've gone virtual. That we announced we were going virtual. We went virtual last year after we started, and we've always limited the class to thirty people, and we kind of got to know everybody. And so there's a good and bad here in this virtuality, but the, 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 the good is, is spreading, our, spreading our message wider and getting to know you folks. So we do want to spend some time, perhaps this is the way to do it, is after class. Uh, and hopefully by graduation, which is July, scheduled for July 3rd on a Saturday, we can have some kind of backyard activity uh, for those that are vaccinated uh, behind the Majeska house. We, we bought a little building right next door to Majeska's house that's still under construction. But uh, those that can come, we had people last year, or the year before, 2019, that drove all the way from Greenville and Rock Hill for weeks to come to the school. We had people that signed up last class from Clemson, which is a six hour round trip, and we tried to talk them out of it. They said, no, we're coming. And then we went virtual. So we know that we've got something that's meaningful to people, and um, we're we're getting it out there. And uh, appreciate, boy, it was really boring if you weren't out there. I'll tell you. And um, I, so we really appreciate, it. Becky. Tell the people how much we enjoyed having somebody to talk to. Y'all have no idea. <laughs> After you all moved out in, in, in the boonies and I wasn't able to come by and argue with you. <laughs> well, Dr. Gallman, when we get our, our facility fixed up in town, it's going to be a, a, like the old place used to be at Grow, a place you could drop by any time, find out what's going on, have a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, hear some jazz, a community center, as well as a school. And so we're looking forward to being able to do that and have all of you there to uh, be part of this beloved community that... Uh, Mr. Fox keeps referring to.